Good afternoon and welcome to today's planning committee. This is not a public meeting, but a meeting the public can attend. I'm Councillor Susan Durant, Chair of the Planning Committee. Before we commence, I'd like to outline the domestic arrangements for the meeting. We are not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the doors at the rear of the chamber on my right. When you've left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency eva evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is in the public square in front of CAS beyond the fountain. I'd like to inform members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio visually recorded. By entering the council chamber, you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the council on its website and on YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent mode. May I remind any, anyone speaking in the meeting that you will need to press the large red button underneath the microphone and ensure the red light is illuminated. This will ensure you are recorded. The meeting is proceeding today on the basis that all members of the committee have read their agenda papers thoroughly and are aware of what they will be considering today. If any members of the committee leave the chamber during consideration of an application, they should ensure that they do not take part in the vote on their return as they will have not heard all the relevant information on that particular item. Thank you. Item one is apologies, and we've received apologies from Councillor Charlie Hogarth, uh, Councillor Sophie Lowe, and Councillor Andy <coughs> Pickering. Everyone else is here. Item two is exclusion of the press and public. There are no exempt items on today's agenda. With item three, do we have any declarations of interest, please? Councillor Cox? Uh, I'm speaking in objection on item two. Thank you for that. Have you completed a declaration form, please, and hand it into the governance officer for me? Item four is the minutes of the last meeting, which was held on the 7th of February, 2023. Can the minutes be moved as a true and accurate record? Can that be moved, please? And that's seconded. And is that agreed? agreed yeah. Thank you. Item five fetches us to the schedule of applications. Application number one is planning application 21 oblique 03311 oblique FULM, which is the proposed residential development with public open space access, landscaping and associated infrastructure, amended plans at land southeast of Old Road, Conisborough. Dave Richards is planning officer and he will introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Hello, everybody. The application was deferred to uh, from the Council's planning committee on the 10th of January to receive updated information in relation to the impact on schools, medical services in Conisborough as well as traffic generation and drainage. I'll touch on these in the presentation, but paragraph 1.2 uh, will point you in the direction of the relevant updated sections of the committee report. Just turning to pre-committee amendments, we have ward members speaking in opposition, Councillor Nigel Ball, Lani May Ball, and Councillor Ian Pearson, uh, speaking collectively for a maximum of 10 minutes. Uh, we have members of the public Mr. Peter Wright and or Mr. Tim Watson. Uh, and we also have the uh, agent or planning agent in support or the applicant, Mr. John Londersborough from, con from Countryside. Finally, a, a further representation was received from uh, Ms. Carol North and Mr. Graham Tonks. I've included their representation, which they were hoping to address um, the committee with, but I've not had anything about whether they're included as within the residents' uh, speaking arrangements, so I've included their comments here for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, so these views can also be heard by members. These relate to uh, air quality matters. Just turning to why the application was deferred, and I'll come to education first. Since the last committee uh, in January, um, a new illustration has been provided by the education team. 
This takes into account more recent data from the school census in 2022, admissions data from the latest school capacity survey and also ONS birth data. The figures uh, reflect an updated cost per place from also from the Department of Education. The two affected schools remain the same. However, the projected costs, as we know, uh, have risen in terms of accommodating new school places, and that means that the revised sum or the revised ask to be delivered through the 106, Section 106 is 1.7 million. This money will be allocated towards offsetting any shortfall in school places in accordance with policy 52 of the local plan. Turning to impact on uh, medical infrastructure, the, again, concerns were raised at the January committee. Uh, as a result, there's been further consultation with the South Yorkshire Integrated Care Board, or the ICB, and NHS England, who have responded to the application. The ICB and NHS England have confirmed no objections from a number of different practice areas, um, but specifically in relation to the Coningsborough Group practice, they've said, well, they're happy to take, to take on new patients and capacity is available. The ICB have said that they are working with the Stonecastle Centre to deliver more floor space where possible. Ultimately, neither the ICB or NHS England have objected to the application and have not asked for any specific contributions either. The application, in our opinion, has considered the healthcare infrastructure implications in accordance with policy 50D. Just turning to flooding and drainage, uh, members raised concerns obviously relating to drainage from the site. Flood risk assessment and drainage strategy makes clear that the site is at low risk uh, from flooding and surface water runoff. There's no evidence of the site previously flooding or has caused flooding elsewhere. There's no evidence of surface water flood risk emanating from the site. And there's no evidence of the site contributing to any other local drainage issue that's been expressed so far. In terms of detailed drainage design, the flood risk assessment has discounted the use of sustainable drainage on the site or discharge to a local, local water course. The proposed drainage system is essentially a sealed system which would capture surface water from hard surfaces. Here shown in, um, in yellow there are the storage areas where the water will be directed to and contained uh, before discharging it slowly into the public sewer at a rate agreed with Yorkshire Water. <coughs> Concerns were raised over the capacity of the system the attenuation tanks are designed to accommodate storm water for a one in 100 year event, plus an additional 40% to make allowance for climate change and a further 10% for increased catchment from the system over time as people build patios and driveways and so on. In essence, it's a 100 year plus a 50 year percent, a 100 year plus 50 percent design criteria is equivalent actually, actually to a one in 250 year storm event. The risk of the tanks filling to capacity, therefore, is considered to be very low. We should obviously also bear in mind that if a severe storm hits, uh, rainwater will already run off primarily overland onto the A630. If development is approved and built out, these flows will be reduced as the water will be stored in the tanks and then held back to discharge at a lower rate. In short, the system has been designed to accommodate surface water for the lifetime of the development and can demonstrate there'd be no increased risk and flood risk elsewhere. Would ask that you consider the evidence set out in the application and the responses from all technical consultees who haven't objected to the application, and that includes the Environment Agency who have now responded as well. Turning to traffic and trip generation concerns have been raised, <coughs> specifically regarding to the existing capacity, of course, Junction capacities, as we set out last time, were carried out as part of the transport assessment. This assessment is considered to be robust. The conclusions from the assessment show, are set out in paragraph 8.71 of the committee report. It shows there will be some increased queuing, particularly at the Clifton Hill and Low Road Junction, but ultimately the development impact is not considered to be severe. This is the test applied in paragraph 111 of the MPPF. Councillor Pearson has previously raised concerns that there's increased queuing already ex being experienced at the junction and through further consultation with highways and obviously the traffic lights are being uh, replaced and altered along that corridor into town, into the city. They have yet to go, as I understand it, a formal optimisation which may have also resulted in an additional impact. Overall, the development scores well in terms of the accessibility of the site 
to local services without using a car. The development is subject to implementing a travel plan to further reduce car dependency, as well as carrying out site mitigation in the Clifton Hill Low Road Junction. A number of improvements will be made to better the accessibility of the development to the existing edge of Conisborough through new walkways, cycle, um, cycle and walkways, and access the already fairly close services that are available in Conisborough. Just turning to air quality because it was raised, raised in the uh, representation. An air quality assessment has been submitted as part of the application and the air quality officer has confirmed that it follows good practice guidance. The conclusions are that there will be some negligible increases in emissions but would not conflict with the principles of protecting air quality management areas of which the low road junction is one of them. The air quality assessment sets out a number of mitigation measures, but essentially um, each new property with a driveway will, or parking will have an electric vehicle charging point. Uh, and also, I've just detailed here, um, the measures set out in the travel plan, which is to be conditioned and delivered through the 106. This essentially helps reduce car dependency um, by promoting the use of non-car methods where possible. Just turning to the overall merits of the scheme, I urge members to concentrate on applying the policies of the local plan. The site has been sequentially assessed as suitable to all the planning constraints and we've taken as a council to allocate it for housing in the local plan. As part of the process, stakeholders such as NHS and the local community have been consulted on its suitability. Furthermore, uh, countryside have done more detailed engagement um, before the application was submitted and that's been incorporated into the scheme as well. The developer requirements for the site have been met and this provides the main housing allocation for Conisper and we should give it significant weight. In terms of individual policies, my view is it complies with the local plan as a whole. It delivers 38 affordable houses, 15% of the site is public open space, over 350 trees, NDSS compliant homes and deliver suitable mitigation to offset any impacts to local amenity. My view development should be granted in accordance with the recommendation and the development plan. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dave. Uh, we've got Councillor Nigel Ball, Laney Ball and Ian Pearson that are ward members that have requested to speak in opposition to the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to 10 minutes collectively please press the large red button when you want to speak and again when you're finished and we'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. I would like to again represent my community, Conisborough and Denneby, and place our objections for this colossal <coughs> development on um, Old Road and Sheffield Road. We made it very clear at the last meeting that 239 houses that are proposed will have a huge impact on our already stretched community. We outlined to the committee that so many residents have contacted us with their concerns, worrying about what it will mean for their community, and they have continued to share their concerns about this since the last meeting. And their fears are largely based on their current experiences within their community, and they deserve to be listened to. At the last meeting, I focused on the sustainability appraisal and demonstrated that what the words say on paper are completely different to reality. The report still says that there's sufficient capacity. We showed and we spoke about how there isn't. We talked about access to a doctor's surgery, because the doctors can say that they can take people on. Doctors can't refuse to take people on the list, but it's about accessibility for them appointments and being able to see a medical professional when in need. And dentists, dentists aren't gonna uh, oppose this but they have no room to take on any NHS patients. So they might be happy to take on private, but there's nobody that is taking on NHS. And I know because I've called them up directly myself to make sure that that's correct. But one of the most deprived wards in the borough, nobody can afford private dentistry. We're also talking about access to schools and our infrastructure such as highways as well. We doubt that the um, additional 51 places that are required in schools will be able to meet that increase. We're, we're disputing that that's enough for nearly 250 three to four bedroom houses. 
We're still arguing that the housing development does not meet housing need. 38 out of 239 are affordable. Our casework remains the same since the last meeting. Residents need sustainable, stable and affordable council properties. Again, we are the most deprived ward in Bop Doncaster. We don't need houses that are being built with electric car charging points where they can't afford the cars or the 200 grand. Our tenants need different housing. But today I want to focus on flooding because I completely disagree with the comments such as there's no risk or there's no impact. And I don't think we really understand the implications for this development on our community that is prone to horrific flooding. So that runoff, that little bit of runoff that we're talking about from the A630 goes from Sheffield Road into Kearsley Brook and down onto Dufton's Close, which sits in between the brook and the River Dom. So the report is stating one in 100 years. The EA no longer use one in 100 years as model for modelling as they know it's out of date and incorrect. Yet we continue to use this narrative and within our reports as well. So I want to share with you today the voices of our community members from Dufton's Close, those who have experienced flooding numerous times, because again, we, we need to separate them words from reality. The amount of once in 100 year flooding currently stands as three in the last 15 years. Mass development on the land will directly feed surface water into Kearsley Brook. This is something that we are extremely worried about. Tens of thousands of pounds have already been spent on modeling for flood defenses. This would have been a waste of effort and money if this development takes place, taking us right back to the beginning again. The development is a huge step back for us on Dufton's. We will certainly result in more anxiety and stress and feeling deflated, as again, our voices will be ignored. Should the application be approved, it would prove an, argu an, an argument for residents on Dufton's that planning decisions in Doncaster have no consideration for flooding and the impact that it will have on others. My young child constantly panics when it rains because they remember what happened so vividly last time. They shouldn't have to worry about this in their own home. They should feel safe. I'm constantly up and down the footpath looking how far the, up the brook is and how far the river is. And I'm constantly checking for flood warnings. When we get the ping on our phones, my heart stops. We can't go through this again. We have lost money, not only on the value of the house, but the insurance is more expensive. And we lose money when we can't work, when we have to deal with this. And we are completely trapped on the estate when it floods. The sense of fear it creates is so hard to explain when you haven't experienced it. So I'm asking the planning committee today, do you hear our residents' voices? Do you understand what the impact of this development will have? Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, as, as my colleague has said, we, we obviously um, massively oppose this development. Um, we also ask planning committee to look at the local plan very carefully before passing this development, because this, whether you like it or not, is a test of our local plan. Um, th this area has been identified as housing land for a number of years, um, but it's actually been ratified within, obviously, the local plan. It was adopted two years ago unanimously by council, even though we as councillors and councillors in other areas had raised strong concerns around housing land allocation and this particular area. On this, we would advise that each contentious area, if challenged, would be submitted to planning committee by councillors to raise objections and would be, would, be, would be subject to the overarching guidance of the local plan and take individual communities, councillors' objections into account. Residents on Low Road, New Hill, Willis Street and Brookside, that's along the stretch of Kearsley Brook, are unanimously fearful of the new development, because I've been door knocking, and the potential flooding of Kearsley Brook through runoff. Additionally, all of these areas are concerned with additional air pollution from an increase of over 300 cars plus daily using this area and adding to the congestion. Low Road has an air quality monitoring unit there. It's the third most polluted area in Doncaster. Material planning consideration as identified the developed by the Department of Communities and Leveling Up. They actually put in place there that we should take into account, um, obviously smells, pollution and fumes, capacity of physical infrastructure, including drainage and water systems and traffic generation. Again, if we turn ourselves to our local plan, that's the first one. We look at our local plan. Um, obviously, we, we're looking to landscapes, which take into account the special qualities of rivers, waterways, wetlands, and the surroundings. 57, um, local plan, which is on drainage, 
wastewater and runoff are managed appropriately and reduce flood risk to existing communities. Will not increase flood risk on site and ensure no flooding on land or building elsewhere. This is the issue. They achieve a reduction of runoff surface water on greenfield sites. None of this is happening and we're actually using this document here as our overarching plan. So this is a test for this. Infrastructure. Health impact assessment should be robust and the healthcare infrastructure implications or any proposed development have been considered and addressed. I'm sorry, but you can't get in at Conisbury Doctors. There's another practice in Denneby, um, and effectively it's the same there. In terms of dentistry, the two dentists in Conisbury are not taking anybody on the NHS waiting list. The one in, in Denneby is, sure, but effectively you've got a two-year wait. So this will just add and compound to that pressure. Education, where significant housing proposals will create or exacerbate a shortfall in local school places, mitigation will be re re required. That nowhere near covers that mitigation on that. Local planning, pollution, take into account national air quality especially, but also localised air quality management areas. Low road is less than a kilometre away and it's the third most um, populated, polluted site in Doncaster. And we're adding an extra 300 cars to this coming down the A630. So in terms of the information from the Environment Agency, they're not bothered, they don't care because effectively the, the, the development is in flood zone one, they don't bother with that. And ID Civil, who's done the work on it, they hold the same position, well actually there'll be no flooding there. Well of course there'll be no flooding because it's top of a hill, it's gonna roll down. Our own flood team are still unsure of where the road gull is and discharging to, where they're discharging to, as they do not have a map. So as far as I'm concerned, this is far from satisfactory and does not address the policies laid out One in the local remaining. plan. And we need to take this guidance on, on board. And obviously, this is effectively um, a test, really, for this. Ian. I'm going to have to be very quick. What I'm going to say is that the local industry is opposed to this. We have three other applications that nobody's talking about that are going to put traffic on the same area that you're going to hear in the near future and that everybody is opposed to it and the flooding you you you've i'm older than the person making the comments and i remember as a kid all the flooding that came off and why the houses and bungalows lower down the hill are built in the way they are because the water does run downhill and i do hope that it is passed that every resident sues businesses. The, the businesses sue the council for negligence because this is outrageous ignoring historic records because somebody lost them when Cunningsborough became part of Doncaster. Thank you for that, Councillor Pearson. That's your 10 minutes up. Okay, uh, right, so we've now got um, a Mr. Peter Wright and a Mr. Tim Watson. Uh, do we have a Mr. Carol, uh, Mrs. Carol North and a Mr. Graham Tonks here as well? No? Okay, thank you. So we've got Mr. Peter Wright and Mr. Tim Watson, who are members of the public, have requested to speak in opposition to the application. Yeah, yeah sorry. Apologies, before we, we'll get you settled there, we're just going to go to questions to our councillors. I'm getting ahead of myself today. Sit heat. Okay, before we go over to members of the public, do any of our uh, committee wish to ask the councillors any questions? No? Thank you. Okay, so this is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes collectively. Please, uh, please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone when you've concluded your submission and we'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Okay, thank you. On behalf of the uh, people of Cunningsbury that's against this, going back to pollution, the A630 uh, Doncaster Old Junction, as we know, it's nitrogen dioxide that's uh, the problem there. And for people that don't know, nitrogen dioxide is serious to health. Nitrogen dioxide is heavier than air. It hangs about, it doesn't blow away, it seeps into the houses and it'll be seeping to the houses down there. Basically, if you add more traffic, which has been admitted, it's going to happen. You're basically putting more lives at risk and it's already over a legal limit. So you're breaking the law, the law's been broken. So you don't go to the pub and have a pint and policemen say, oh, you're quite all right to drive because you're just, you're just near it. You don't go and have another four pints, do you? It's, it's as simple as that. So yeah, 
more traffic, it's, it's, it's serious down there. Right, flooding. On the 14th of January, a photo was taken, which I have here, from one of the boreholes that was put in the field at the front of my house. Right, it was 300 millimetres below surface level. You tell me how that field isn't flooding, right, after two days of rain. Right, four days of rain, it runs off the field and it runs down the road. There's a constant brown run down the road. My friend at the side of me here, who lives at the hilltop, they were not allowed to have a cesspit to join into the cesspit at the farm across the road, right? Septic, Septic tank. So uh, the water, they said, that they was told that there was be too much water coming out of it, right? Out of four houses into the brook. All this working out has not been taken into account. They've got uh, Ravenfield, Clifton, Micklebrig, Cunningsborough Parks, these all run into the brook. Right, all this lot has not been taken into account. You want in 100 years or you want in 10 years or whatever you're working out. Listen, I go down there often with the dogs and it's flooded all the time. So I don't care what your working outs are, what you've put into computer, what your computer modeling is, it's all a load of crap. I'm sorry for saying that, but that's what it is. Uh, that's how that's how it is, and it does flood. And I'll, I'll take any of you down there to prove it. And like I said, these chaps had to have a set uh, a proper cesspit put in. They also then had to pay for a lay-by, right, on Old Road, to have the lorries to pull in to empty the septic tanks because they wasn't allowed to join into the, the cesspit across the road. Out of their own money. They've had to have a cligester put in and everything, right? And they're saying that Old Road can take the traffic or the bin men can go down. Well, here you are. There's some photos. If somebody wants to pick them up and show them to the people over there, you can see how busy and how, how narrow old road is. You cannot get... We nearly got knocked over Saturday measuring the road. OK? So, right, the road itself. Main road, Sheffield Road, is 24 foot wide. You can't get two lorries and a car down there. You've got ghost junctions, which is white lines. Micklebrig Grove, there's constant crashes down there. Little dings, yeah, I know, but you get the odd one or two main ones. Old road, 18 foot wide, two cars, the mirror to mirror. You tell me how the hell you can get municipal vehicles down there safely. You can get fire engines down there safely. You can't do it. It's used as a racetrack. I'll admit I've done it myself. Um, you know, and it's, and it's really not. We, got, we nearly got it Saturday, just measuring the road. Right. How can cars pull out onto that safely off old road? You can't. They've had to have a lay-by so they can creep out and see what's happening to get out. And you've got to drive straight onto, onto the old road. Trust me, I'm, like I said, I know I'm, 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 I'm from Conisborough. I was born there, I've grown up there, I know it, and I'm passionate about it. Right, so the doctors, going back to the doctors, saying that Conisborough Group Practice in our local magazine that comes out every you've week... one minute remaining. ...contradicting what has been said, saying that they haven't got room, they haven't got capacity, they can't cope. It's all there. Now, Tim. Just on the, while we're on that, sorry. Just while we're on the same subject, the uh, antisocial behaviour problem that Conisborough does have will be increased with all these park areas. Uh, the older people in Conisborough don't go down the village at night because they're frightened because of the antisocial behaviour and the amount of needles that are collected down there is diabolical. My other concern is the concern of the neighbours and the people that will this development will sit in the middle of. Up to now, we've been treated like mushrooms. We are being given no information, no up-to-date plans. We're not being given anything. Surely, we as people that bank, bank onto this development, me personally, from having a nice open field, I'm going to have five back gardens Apologies backing onto my house. But we do go to committee that can ask you some questions. Uh, right, committee, do we have any questions that we would like to ask Mr. Wright or Mr. Watson? No? Oh, okay, thank you very much for your submission.
Thank you, Chair. Uh, and good afternoon, members. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today in support of Countryside's application <coughs> for this development of 239 new homes on land between Old Road and Sheffield Road in Consborough. Uh, we have heard uh, members resolve to defer the decision on this application at the 10th of January committee uh, to allow time for further clarity to be sought in respect of drainage and the development's effect on local services and infrastructure. As such, I intend to focus on these reasons for deferral uh, and how they have been addressed since the last committee. Uh, as members have heard, the starting point for the determination of this application is the Doncaster Local Plan, uh, which was adopted in 2021 following a detailed and extensive period of evidence gathering uh, and examination in public. Um, the allocation of the site in the Local Plan uh, was made following the outcome of a detailed sustainability appraisal, which was produced with extensive consultation with all relevant stakeholders, and this included the healthcare providers, education services, uh, and the lead local flood authority amongst others. Uh, the site is therefore sustainable in the context of national and local planning policy. Uh, turning to the reasons for deferral, um, it is important to note that following additional consultation with the Ed Education Authority, the South Yorkshire Integrated Care Board and the Lead Local Flood Authority, uh, that these consultees have maintained their support for the proposal. In respect of school places, the Education Authority has reissued an up-to-date response that includes a revised pupil projections based on the latest school census data and uplifted cost per place, which is based on increasing build costs, which are being experienced across the building construction industry. Uh, the response confirmed, however, that the me methodology used in calculating the number of pupils that would come from the development was correct, and this is the standard used across the borough um, and is based on, on the experiences of the healthcare, uh, sorry, education providers in this borough. Uh, so Countryside will make a contribution towards local education provision in line with the latest response uh, of the Education Authority, which will provide the additional capacity required to accommodate the development. Therefore, the proposal will result in no adverse impact on local education provision. Turning now to capacity in the local GP practices and their ability to provide for any additional patients that will arise from the development, uh, as we have heard, again, uh, the South Yorkshire Integrated Care Board, um, who are responsible for, for providing health care in the Connellsborough area, uh, has confirmed that local surgeries are accepting new patients and no objection to the proposals have been raised. Um, NHS services, it's important to note, um, are funded by central government, and that funding is calculated, taking into account uh, projected population growth, and that takes into account migration into the area, which would come about as a result of new development. Uh, the development will therefore uh, result in no adverse impact on local healthcare provision. Uh, then turning now to drainage and flood risk, uh, it is clear from the response of the lead local flood authority and Yorkshire Water and the Environment Agency that they are entirely satisfied that the proposal, the proposed rather, uh, surface water drainage system will not result in an increased risk of flooding elsewhere. And this is the important point here um, to, to, to note um, is that in its current greenfield form, water does run off the site um, currently. Um, the proposal will result in only 10% of that existing runoff discharging from the site. Um, this is because the proposed surface water attenuation on site will store the rainwater, <clears throat> as we've heard, in the up to 100, uh, one in 100 year event, plus an additional 50% uh, for climate change in urban creep. Uh, as we've heard again, this in essence provides a one in 250 year storm event. Um, as such, then in, in capturing the surface water and storing it on site, the development will result in significantly less surface water reaching downstream water courses than is currently the case. Um, all flood risk and drainage calculations have been undertaken again using standard recognised uh, across the industry and by all statutory bodies. One uh, minute remaining. Thank you, including the lead local flood authority in Yorkshire Water, who are entirely supportive of the scheme. Uh, as such, the development will not result in an increased risk of flooding elsewhere. On the contrary, it will provide for betterment through the introduction of surface water attenuation. Uh, in summary then, uh, it has been demonstrated that the additional queries raised by members at the January Planning Committee have been satisfactorily addressed and that the proposal uh, represents sustainable development that is in complete accordance with the adopted local plan uh, and is supported by officers and all statutory consultees. Uh, I therefore respectfully request you follow the advice of your officers and resolve to approve this application. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your submission. Uh, I'm now going to ask the committee members if they wish to ask Mr Long for any questions in relation to his submission. Councillor Cox. 
Thank you. Um, regarding drainage, so what, what you're saying is that your application will improve the, the chances of Connorsborough flooding? Uh, sorry, not, not improve it, it, it will stop it flooding? Uh, no, I didn't go as far as to say it would stop it flooding. Um, the point is that it will not increase the risk of flooding, and that's the only, um, only thing that this committee can consider. Um, is whether and, and planning policy can consider is whether it will increase the risk of flooding, and it, I can categorically tell you that it will not, um, and that if anything, there is a, a betterment um, brought about. Is it not the case that um, a development is not supposed to? It, it's supposed to make it better. You're supposed to improve on what's there in regarding any water runoff. You don't just keep the same, do you? Is that what you're looking at? The same amount of water runoff, or I'm I'm lost in what you're saying, if I'm honest. No, I, I'm not saying the development um, is expected to improve the situation. Um, Policy is clear that it, it it can't make it any worse. Um, but as a result of taking into account um, the increased likelihood of extreme storm events brought about by climate change, um, additional capacity is built into developments at this stage to ensure that they are safe for at least 100 years. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. Um, one, one of the things I've, I've just spent the last 10 minutes listening, but also making a few calculations, of which I'll, I'll probably come to the officer with a couple of questions. Um, you keep mentioning local plan as if it's some sort of Bible, okay, and it's backing up your development. The local plan for that site actually indicates 200 properties. You've gone way over with 239. It also goes on to say that the 200 properties should be achievable and developable over a 15 year period from when the local plan came out. You're wanting to put more than 200 properties onto a land within a couple of years of that, well a year actually a local plan coming out. That so we're looking at all these issues that everybody's concerned about all boils down to one thing density of the development and you guys have put that forward with that density level on it do you still stand by that that, that density level you think is okay uh, i'd like to start by saying the number set out in the local plan is an indicative capacity only it's not intended to be an upper limit um it, it's of guidance um, and that, that, that's across all allocations within the local plan. Um, the test is whether all policies of the local plan have been addressed and met satisfactorily uh, through a development. And in this case, there is no conflict caused by the development with, with any of the local plan policies. Um, and the officers have, um, have carried out a full assessment and come to that conclusion um, that 239 dwellings in this location uh, can be accommodated within <clears throat> the policy set out. Um, and also on the 15-year the, the, the point, um, I'd like to point out that its developments don't happen overnight. Um, where the local plan was adopted, we then submitted a, a, an application to start um, progress on the development. Um, it, it will build out at a rate of something like 30 to 50 dwellings per annum, um, which will mean it will take at least six or seven years from this point onwards before the development is, is complete. Um, and therefore, it, it, it's not a sudden influx of population to the area, it's a gradual increase. Um, and as we've heard, um, the local services uh, are able to accommodate that with the projected um, funding that we will provide for education to local education sorry, via Section 106 to local education services and NHS funding, which will take into account population growth, um, including this development. Uh, we're going to go to Councillor Stapleton for another question, then Councillor Cox. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I've heard what you said there. One, one of the things that concern me, we see, everybody seems to be ignoring this density because the density is what creates all the other issues and problems that the community are having. Okay, now... Forget about the square metre size of each property. Looking at the local plans, it's 
91 hectares, which works out at uh, 36,057 square metres, okay, which calculate out on your proposed plan of 239 properties is 150.86 square metres. And I'd, I'd take that includes the green areas, the roads, everything, but per house or per um, dwelling, it works out just over 150 square metres per property. If you just stuck to the local plan of indicative 200, which we don't just make those figures up, and I am getting a bit um, frustrated that you're telling us what we can and can't consider. We know what we consider. We don't need you to tell us, okay? Now, the if you, you'd have followed that, that comes in at 180 square meters per dwelling density for the site. The other, the other, the other, even though it's not a material planning reason for this, there is another site in the local plan for Collingeborough that comes in indicative of 198 square meters per dwelling. And I'm always looking at density. So Councillor Stapleton, can we just stick to this application? Yeah, know what yeah you're I'll keep that out. Yeah, that's fine. Plan. That's fine, Chair. But my point is, is is I think where you're failing to recognise where you're hitting the bumps in the road regarding this development as you've moved forward with it. And it may well be a, a, a financial reasons, and I get that. But you've come up with a proposal that to me doesn't follow local plan. It causes Can we get to the question, please, Councillor Staples? Yeah, sorry. It causes no end of problems further down the line. Is there any way you as a company would look at reducing the density of that site? Uh, I can only really repeat that um, that it's been found that that... Can did, I just say, Councillor Stapleton, we can only look at the application that's in front of us, so we're not really in a position to accept an answer on that question. We've got to... So thank you for that. Councillor Park. Thank you. Um, yeah, regarding the, the schools and NHS monies that would be, be, be out there for community, at what point would that, that money be freed up? Would it, begin, would it be at the beginning or the end of the development? Well, in terms of the um, education contributions, the triggers are yet to be agreed. However, there will be, uh, it will likely be a staged um, uh, contributions in that there'll be a certain amount um, at commencement of the, de the development, um, a certain amount at let's say 100 dwellings and then the rest are let's say 200 dwellings, that's just off the top of my head so it, it would be released in stages throughout the development um, just, to, just to allow that money to be released to the education authority to provide the services as the population increases. Councillor Duncan Anderson. Thanks. Uh, given the concerns we've had raised about the pollution levels in the area and the impact this will possibly have, I am concerned as to the effectiveness of the travel plan to mitigate those impacts. Uh, as someone has already raised, electric vehicle charging points are fine, but unless you're also going to provide an electric vehicle, then most people aren't going to have them at this stage. They're still prohibitively expensive. Most people in Doncaster, and I suspect most people in Coningsborough. And Many of the other measures amount to essentially giving people a bus timetable in a time where bus services are dire at best and looking to get worse. So what can you say to convince me that your travel plan is actually robust enough to do what it intends to do? Uh, I, I can't really speak in detail of the, the, the travel plan. Um, however, the Highway Authority is happy with the, um, the principles set out within it. Um, I, it's also a case that at this stage it's only an indicative travel plan um, and that a detailed travel plan will be agreed and conditioned um, for later determination with the highway authority um, at which point other perhaps you know whatever's considered suitable at that time to, to address the, um, the, the you know the requirements for air quality mitigation um, will be written into the travel plan and that will then be monitored by the local authority to ensure that uh, those that the targets are being met um, and that the measures are being put in place. That's well and good, but you can't ask us to make a decision based on something that might exist in the future. Like, That's not going to convince me to not be concerned about the pollution aspect. So, Sorry, can I respond to that or...? I mean, if you've got um, something concrete that you can tell me is going to be in the finalised version of the travel plan, then great, that might convince me. But you can't just say there will be one that will work. That's not 
an argument in favour of your development? It's it's the, it's within the, the powers of the highway authority to determine whether it will work or not, um, and they have that power uh, as we discharge the condition. Um, it's also worth pointing out the air quality uh, environmental health officer is satisfied with the indicative package offered. Thank you for that. Do we have any other questions? Councillor Bob Anderson. Hiya. Um, on the NHS part, there's 7.35, 7.36. It says the Coningsborough Group Practice is happy to take on additional patients, but doesn't currently feel it has enough space in its current building and would need additional staff, and that the integrated care board are working with them on this. Also, the dentistry, it says there is a reduced capacity across the dental sector due to the availability of clinical workforce and issues around recruitment and retention. I appreciate there won't be an additional seven to 800 patients straight away as it will be built in stages, but eventually there will be. So my concern is how will these facilities cope and is there anything concrete in place? Because as we know, people are struggling to get dentistry and surgery appointments. I understand <clears throat> and obviously I've heard what people are saying here today. Um, it's <laughs> anecdotal, but I also, where I live, I'm struggling um, to access those services. I know that doesn't make it any easier for anyone in this room who's struggling to access those services. Um, I, I think I just need to state that really in this case, we have to think about what the, how we determine this application um, <clears throat> and the funding mechanisms that we've already explained that will uh, factor in population increases. Um, as you say, it won't happen overnight, but as the development progresses, population in the area increases, additional funding will be available for local healthcare services. Um, it's not strictly the, the responsibility of this development to provide that funding directly. Thank you for that. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we're now gonna go into debate. Does any member wish to comment on the report or ask the uh, case officer a question? That, can I start first? <laughs> Uh, can you just explain when we're inquiring about the sustainability of the infrastructure that's in place? Um, we've mentioned that um, information has been asked regarding the dentistry and the NHS. Did we specifically ask what capacity they have for NHS patients so we can compare NHS patients to private? Because obviously, being a deprived community, it's important that it is NHS patients that have got access. And also regarding the uh, um, the air pollution, if we're already above uh, the recommended rate, it's already been stated regarding electric vehicles are not really afforda affordable, what other measures would be put in place to address that? Thank you, Chair. In relation to consultation with the ICB and the NHS, oh, sorry, NHS England, um, representatives or directors from one from GP practice, one from D uh, from the dentist sector, and one from the pharmacy sector. Uh, all contact details were provided through our public health team, uh, and they're at the if you like the cutting edge of how they source funding through NHS England to then filter down into making sure, as is their legal requirement, that the ICB deliver those healthcare, um, to, to, they deliver the healthcare infrastructure in that particular region. So the question put to them was around the existing, or the, ex the capacity of existing services under the NHS and whether they would cope, or what's the situation in terms of capacity and what are the implications as a result of this development? And the responses are set out in the committee report from each of those three sectors. And as has been picked up through the other speakers, there's clearly capacity or issues with clinical staff. Uh, and I don't think that's any different or any secret compared to other sectors, whether it's you know, any public sector, <laughs> I would say. Um, but you know, I think we should make a differentiation between the, the struggles in um, recruiting and retaining staff and a system where it's been highlighted the local services provided under the NHS are delivered through essentially direct taxation 
that's then filtered down through the award of grants through to the ICB, who project or should project and plan for future population growth in that region. And this is specifically why, when we've consulted with these region or with these sectors, they've not asked for any contribution, and they believe that there is capacity because essentially they should already be planning for future population growth in Coningsborough. And this goes back before this application was submitted to the local plan stage where the, NA, uh, the primary care trusts will be consulted at each stage of the plan preparation from the initial call for sites and then sequentially sites were filtered down into preferred sites and then the publication of the local plan that includes this as an allocated site at each stage. There were no issues or no objections raised in terms of capacity for NHS services in this location. And I, without having them in the room, I can't say for certain, but that what should be happening in the background is that the NHS are providing or planning for future growth on the basis of this site being allocated. So where do we come to now? We, we come to the situation as um, planning agents set out, Mr Lonsborough, that this won't appear straight away. It's an indicative site for 200, but that is clearly indicative. It's only once you get into the nuts and bolts of um, a site layout that you then form a final number of dwellings, and this has been reduced from circa 250 down to 239, that we know the number of units to be provided on this allocated site. I can only reiterate that, as I say, we, they should be the NHS providers should be planning for this future growth in line with their strategies that run alongside the planning system and allocating this site and granting planning permission for this housing to then be built out over a number of years. Even if this, this site is granted planning permission, there will still be that foresight to then for, for the ICB to consider how they respond to that. And this is what they've put in their response. They're essentially already working with the Stonegate Group to look at providing more capacity, I presume, in the anticipation of not only growth from this housing development if it's granted planning permission, but migration growth where people come and go from an area, there may be residents who would change the part of Connorsburg that they live in, and so on. So all that's going on in the background. And in a roundabout way, coming back to your question, Chair, you know, they are already planning for, and admittedly the question is for NHS services. Dentistry is a bit different because it's a much more open to private sector competition as well, as well. But essentially in that situation, if there is demand, then there will be supply provided to accommodate it through the, through the market. Turning to the matters of air quality, the, an air, or, I've touched on it in the report, but essentially the air quality assessment has considered all the suitable sensitive receptors in the area and that, and they paid particular focus on the fact that the low road junction is an air quality management area. <coughs> so the strategy there, and they would have taken into account all of the current legislative guidance on it, is that certainly there shouldn't be any significant detrimental impact to air quality in that region. However, the report concludes is it's, there's a negligible impact. Now, 300 cars sounds like a lot, um, but not all these cars are in one place at one time. And actually negligible, I think, is it, if you look at the traffic flows and the survey data, is the fact that there may be only a couple of cars adding to that arrangement at any one time, or adding to air quality issues in that area at any one time. So the conclusions of the air quality assessment are that it is a late negligible impact, i.e. very little. Uh, and that's how, that's an interpretation shared by our quality officer who agrees that the report has been carried out in accordance with the correct methodology and recommended guidance. And that's what's put towards you. Thank you for that. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. Um, just going back really to what Councillor Anderson mentioned earlier about the uh, travel plan. Am I right in thinking that we that this application does not have a complete travel plan as part of it? Have I read have I heard right? There's two parts to to my answer. The first is a travel plan has been prepared and submitted with the application, and you can see that they've um, in well, I mean this is part of the air quality assessment 
that they've couched what measures are included in the travel plan as, as part of their report, and that's prepared by Optima Highways and Transportation, as you can see. But essentially, each major development as required by planning policy follows the same approach. There will be an appointment of a travel plan coordinator who is essentially the, the role is to reduce car dependency for this new development and try and encourage non-car methods of, of new residents moving in to not use the car, but to actually use sustainable methods of transport. So you can see through the various measures, it, it undertakes a formulaic approach, but providing residents with questionnaires, monitoring and reviewing the travel plan performance on an annual basis, um, information gathering, and then you know trying to relay behavior strategies to try and reduce car demand, car sharing proposals maybe for local businesses, details of bus provision and services, the use of home delivery services and so on. So this is an indicative travel plan that's been submitted with the application. It's conditioned and, and will be worked on with our highways team through approval, post approval, and then through the 106 as an agreed phasing, if you like. But this is indicative to show the sort of measures that we'll be looking to do. The second part of the answer to the question is that the site is inherently well located in terms of the existing amenities and services in Conisborough. So theoretically, there should be, if you like, a more suppressed level of car use. Absolutely, you've got to go in a car eventually to go wider afield, of course. But it's on a main bus route. It's within 25, 30, meters, 30 minutes max in walking distance from all the major services and amenities in Conisborough. You're within 30 minutes of traveling by cycle to the railway station and so on. Many reasons why this site has been allocated is because of all these sites in and around Conisborough that were looked at and then discounted for various reasons, including other Greenbelt sites, uh, areas of flood risk and so on. This site is, has been considered sequentially as an accessible and sustainable site. That isn't mentioned in the travel plan other than it, in the, sorry, in the new strategy because it's already taken as given that the site should suppress car um, use fundamentally because it's well located to the existing urban edge of Conisborough. That's helpful. Thanks, Dave. I didn't understand half of that, but hey, there you go. Um, the, I'm looking at this and it, we're reading this and it's saying upon occupation, upon occupation, all the way down. Is, I'm assuming that, that, again, looking at it, you said personal. So every time somebody buys a property and occupies it, somebody from the developers, going, or Optima, is going to go and knock on the door and try and persuade them not to use the car. If I bought an house on that estate and anybody knocks on my door to tell me that, you know the answer I'm going to give them. Now I'll use my car when I want to. So I, th I don't really think it's an effective thing. What I'm concerned about is we're told to deal with the application that's put in front of us. So you're mentioning about all the developments around. I don't, that's can't even take that into consideration and, and I'd urge colleagues not to. We've got to look at just this. And the way I'm seeing it at the minute, there's a travel plan that's ineffective because uh, as Councillor Anderson pointed out, it's based upon projections of if, ands, and buts, and maybes. Now, if, ands, and buts, and maybes, we might get um, 300 houses occupied by people with no teeth who are perfectly healthy and don't need a car. That ain't gonna happen, is it? So if we're looking to deal with the here and now, We've got an application in front of us that does not have a comprehensive travel plan. Now, again, I appreciate we have to deal with this one and not compare it to others, but we wouldn't pass anything, surely, that didn't have a comprehensive plan, because there's no plan there. That's just telling me upon completion, blah, blah, blah. It's wishy-washy. Sorry, but thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, Dave and Terry wants to come in as well. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate where you're coming from on that. Um, I, I think there's a combination of factors that we used in order to, to kind of offset and mitigate developments in these circumstances. So one of those is that the travel plan will give us an indication of the measures that they're going to put in place in order to help mitigate the development through encouraging non-car use. So you've got, you've got the measures on, on screen there. In addition to that, there's a kind of belt and braces approach. So you'll see at paragraph 136 of the report, there's a travel bond, uh, travel plan bond. Um, so that that's a, a commuted sum given to the council hel held in an account. And basically we monitor the travel plan to make sure that they're doing what they said they're going to do within these measures. If they don't use do that, 
um, then we can draw down upon the money and do that for them, which will be mechanisms in order to encourage car use, uh, non-car use, sorry. You've also got the combination of obviously the other conditions uh, in place, which is things about secure cycle uh, parking. You've got EV charging points. I appreciate yours and, and Councillor Anderson's approach to um, the complexities and affordability of EV charging at present. Um, you've also heard that, that the scheme isn't going to be, if planning permission is granted today, isn't going to be developed all at once. You're not going to have 239 houses built on the site on week one. This is a phased development that will take six or seven years. Um, there's obviously aspirations amongst the government in order to bring forward sustainability and EV charging. So it may well dovetail that as this development scheme comes forward and progresses to fruition, that the price and affordability of EV uh, car usage also comes down. Um, so it, it, in terms of future proof in the site, Obviously, the policies and the local plan are there to, to try and promote these kind of uh, sustainable transport methods. So um, it's kind of taking those considerations into account. Thank you for that. Um, there's, a, there's an element of there where, where I sort of understand what you're saying, but I'm, I'm still mindful of, of Councillor Anderson's comments and I support them. Um, the, the, I'm still not getting what well, you're talking about a travel a travel bond we can draw down we can encourage people not to use a car how because you know the, <laughs> what we're going to do just allow the potholes to stay there and which is, seems to be the norm you know let's let, let the potholes go and let's not bother with drainage and, and then nobody will use the cars because the, the, the roads are rubbish you know that's not so, serving the people of Conisborough um, I, I just fail to see where this saying we're going to encourage people not to use their cars and how that can become an effective strategy um, because you might want that but the people that live there might not want it and this is again where we're failing where we're doing things to a community as opposed to doing what the community want and which is you know across all parts of council that does happen occasionally I, I get that but I've just got to come back to the same thing. We're sat here with an application. We're, we're encouraged to, to deal with the application in front of us. And for me personally, I'm seeing high density that's causing knock-on effect on, on lots of different areas that's causing concerns for members and also the fact there is no effective travel plan. So that, really, that's all I'm going to say. But no questions. Thank you. Just to make a final point on travel plans is... I respectfully disagree. I think it's only appropriate that you do an indicative travel plan as part of a planning application. But you, if you did a belt and braces approach and dictate how people, as you say, you move into a property and you, you get told how to operate or live your life, you will tell them to knackers. What would actually happen at, it, through an indicative travel plan is you need to know who you're dealing with, who's moving in. You need to know their behaviour habits. You need to know where they're working. And you can only do that by doing questionnaires and trying to get information from each tranche of residents as they move in. So I think it's correct to do a structured approach that's annually monitored. And you can see new residents moving in. You, you get to know their behaviours and patterns. They might work down the street at the, you know, at the industrial centre or the, or the car sales place down the road. They may work, may work further afield. And as Gary says, the idea of the travel bond then is if, if it looks like the targets aren't being met or if the number of people moving in have got behaviours where they, they're resistant to change and they, they're still using the car. There's, you know, in the past we've used, for example, through the South Yorkshire Tran uh, Transport Passenger Executive bus passes and so on and, and initiatives to use public transport using the money to try and influence that behaviour. And that's just one example. So... I just wanted to make the point that it's, I think it is important to provide an indicative strategy to, to begin with because to do a comprehensive one is a sort of abortive if the behaviour patterns aren't what they anticipated. Thank you for that, Dave. Councillor Anderson. Yeah, no one to spend too much time on it, but to take up the same thread. Uh, in an area where you don't already have a problem with air quality, having an indicative travel plan is probably more acceptable. But when we're already above the safe limits, any increase is significant, however small. 
Therefore, a more robust approach is required in that scenario, which is the one we are faced with. Uh, would just like to add, I have no problem with EV charging points. I think it's a great thing. And if you were just asking me to take into consider that as being one of the virtues of the scheme and to take that into the balance, I would have no problem with that. But when you're asking me to treat that as a mitigating factor for the air quality problems without some other way to uh, do it, I just can't accept that as a robust system for uh, a robust strategy. Uh, I also wanted to say that no matter what we hear from bodies like the, uh, the Integrated Care Board saying there is capacity, if we've got the local councillors saying there isn't, and when one of those councillors is the cabinet member for public health and therefore the highest authority on public health matters within this council, we have to go with what he's telling us, not with what some outside body is telling us who don't have that kind of expertise. Thanks. Councillor Palmer. Thank you. I totally agree with my colleagues. Um, there's too many anomalies on this site, and one being that this site is too far away from the public uh, train station for a start. You just said um, it's uh, 30 minutes away. That's 30 minutes added onto your daily travel. You know, so I wish you luck with the travel plan to get people away from the cars. Thank you. Gary. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I appreciate your point. Um, what I would say is that the counter to that is that as part of the local plan adoption, the site was sustainability appraised. It went through a green belt review. Um, so it, it was considered in terms of the housing need requirements of the Connorsborough and Denedby area that there was a requirement for some additional houses within that within that ward. Um, it's gone through that process to find the most sustainable site in order to fulfil those uh, housing requirements. It was between this and another site at, at Clifton. The site at Clifton wouldn't have provided the level of or the quantum of development needed in order to fulfil that need requirement. And so this was the, the, the next best in terms of size, sustainability, uh, the Greenbelt Review that would provide the amount of uh, housing needed for uh, Connorsborough and Denneby. Um, so in terms of sustainability credentials, th this is good because it's, it's, it's gone through that examination in public. It's been through, uh, well, you'll see uh, paragraph uh, 8.29 in terms of uh, the, the amount of regulations it's gone through, regulation 18, 19, 22, uh, before then even get into an ex independent examination. So it's gone through the kind of statutory levels of, uh, of consideration to uh, looking at sustainability cr uh, credentials. So uh, I appreciate your point, but it, it has been carefully considered as part of the local plan allocation. Councillor Duncan Anderson. Yeah, a uh, question on allocation. As Councillor Stapleton pointed out, the allocation for the site is 200, and I take it on board that that's an indicative figure, not an absolute. But we're not talking about just above. We're not talking 206, 207. We're not talking 5, 10, or even 15 percent above. We're talking nearly 20 percent above the indicative figure. How far can you go before it's no longer in line with what was indicated in the plan? Yes, yeah, that's a really good question, Councillor. I, I don't think. Um, that, well, there, there isn't a ceiling. In, to be brutally honest, um, the, the, the local plan is not built like that. It's an indicative plan that gives you an indication as to uh, how many houses are could be realistically achieved on a, a, each individual site. But the local plan stage is a high level uh, indication. Um, what's taken place as part of a, an application is to look at the finer grain of, of what's being proposed. So uh, as Dave's indicated, the scheme has been reduced already. Um, from circa 250 to 239 um, and it's gone through a vigorous consultation um, uh, process so again you'll see within the report there are uh, the best part of four pages worth of consultations that have taken place one of which is our urban design officer who has no objections to the proposed layout so that's taken into consideration things like separation distances uh, the size of dwellings the amenity space is attributed with them uh, you've also got the public open space officer, you've got open space delivered on site here. So in terms of a, a scheme that works functionally uh, and meets the required standards, th this scheme does it, which is why it's got the recommendation that it has done. Um, so in t it, just coming back to your point about um, 
the numbers, the numbers, as, as has been pointed out, are an indicative uh, number of what the quantum of development could be, but it can't be a fixed number to say, thou shalt have 200 and no more, because it would depend on, on the individual layouts, the individual scheme and how it functions. Yeah, I take that on board. I just think we've gone past at 20% nearly, that's gone past the point of you fitting in a bit more than we thought we could in the initial thing. This is a lot more. If you applied 20% increase to say the unity development, that would be an extra 600 houses. So that's just where I am and I think that's where the committee is. So I'm starting to feel out how we can form a uh, materially justified position. Yeah, th thanks for that. I, I just wanted to make a point as well. I know Councillor Stapleton mentioned about density. Um, I've, I've done a brief calculation on, on the site on the basis of, of how many houses are being proposed. The, the density is at 25.7 dwellings per hectare, so round it up to 26 dwellings per hectare, which is, is not overly dense. Um, we don't work on kind of density levels anymore. There used to be a time where you would work on kind of main urban area, and that was generally between 33 and 37 dwellings per hectare uh, for, for a typical urban area. Um, those kind of days are gone where you look at that you, you're now looking at the kind of individual merits of, of the site but kind of old school looking at how many houses you get per per um, acre or, or hectare um, the the scheme I wouldn't say is, is an overly dense scheme given what else you've got on site in terms of deliverability of open space Thank you for that Gary do we have any other questions to the officers Councillor Cox There we are. Um, I, I think this is going a bit, a bit further than just this. It, 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 just beg me forgiveness for a second. But same as, as Councillor Ball says, this is not just a, a, a looking at this application. It's also a test for the local plan. And what we're seeing, I think, in, in deliberation of this is that the, the test is showing that the local plan has flaws which is, is kind of concerning, where this is the guidance, and we keep, keep saying indicative guidance, what is the local plan actually going to do moving forward? I mean, we, we've got travel bonds. We know that different applications that come with a travel bond, but just ones within, within our patch, we never see anything coming forward to support residents with travel issues. So, you know, what is the purpose of it? I think the question is bigger than than just this, and I'm sorry, but I'd be I can't vote for this until we get something that's absolutely nailed down on on all of it on on where we are. So the indicative and guessing, it just gets me. Well, w w with respect, council, we're not guessing. We have a we, we have a layout. We have, we accept that there's. There's an indicative capacity for 200 and it's more than that. But they've shown through the application of the design policies that it meets the NDSS standards, which has been applied through the local plan where it wasn't before. Where it accounts for a substantial increase in the amount of landscaping on the site. So 350 trees, you know, thousands um, of square meters of, of hedgerows and shrubbery and planting and so on. Where it is structured through the legal agreement to deliver biodiversity net gain improvements to at least 10%, which isn't, as others have said already, isn't currently a mandatory requirement, but it is in our local plan, which they've provided. They'll be providing Greenbelt compensatory improvements through the um, scheme as a result of the site allocation. And just turning to the, <coughs> the capacity if you like, for the site, and Gary's already mentioned that historically that's actually quite a low figure in terms of density. One of the principles of the MPPF is that you build to increase densities where they allow, especially in areas where they're considered to be reasonably sustainable, such as this, and this is why it's an allocation. So I think there are parts of the local plan, bluntly, where we we can now enforce and make sure that that's delivered where it hasn't previously, such as BNG, such as NDSS, and so on. And I would suggest that the 
application through the committee report in front of you where it's gone through an extensive level of consultation where all internal and external consultees are happy with it in the terms of their prospective impact suggests that the, plan, the local plan is working in the sense we we brought forward one of the first schemes with the local plan in adoption where it we have no objections we have no conflicts as we've heard over the last few months with the perhaps tensions with different parts of the plan your officers feel actually it's, it's fully in accordance with the plan and I think office I think members should be mindful of that thank you for that Dave do we have any other questions no is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to conditions and the signing of a section 106 agreement is there anyone willing to move this application no therefore is there an alternative motion put forward recommendation sure. no, I move we reject it and we do so on the basis of impact on air quality particularly because we are not convinced of the robustness of the uh, uh, mitigation strategy put before us. Uh, also, the impact on uh, overstretched healthcare capacity in the area and the potential for additional flood risk, which we've heard from local members. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. Thank you, Chair. I, I agree with every, everything uh, Councillor Anderson just said. Um, again, the, the, I'm not going to go into statement. Sorry, um, <laughs> sorry, Chair. Uh, yeah, the, the the other thing is obviously that the, the density. Whilst I accept what officers are telling me, that this is a site that, that a lot of the issues, including what Council Anderson put, has been brought out because of the number of houses on there. Um, so again, I support the, the motion, but we do actually reject. So something along the lines of the fact that we believe that. This level of density is a departure from the development plan. Okay. I'm happy to accept uh, that as part of my motion. Thank you. And you're seconding that motion, Councillor Faberton. Uh, um, <laughs> there, there, there are several issues in this. Um, just dealing with the, la the last point there, the departure from the development plan, I, I don't think you can have it as a departure from the development plan because it's an allocated site. So I, I would strongly advise you to drop that as a, as a reason for refusal. Um, in terms of the other aspects of the, the concerns that you've got, um, the overstretched healthcare uh, part of the reason for refusal, I, I appreciate members' view on this, but you've You've obviously had information from officers where they've gone away and got the information to provide within the report on that. So um, I, what I would say is we'd, we'd need evidence in order to help support that reason for refusal if that was coming forward. Likewise, flood risk. We, we've kind of been through this in terms of what's happening with uh, in, in terms of the consultation responses that we've had. So you've had Seven Trent, Yorkshire Water, Internal Drainage, Environment Agency, all of which have raised no objection. So it, it's entirely members' choice if you want to refuse planning permission on that basis, on the basis of those reasons for refusal. So air quality, overstretched healthcare, flood risk and density. But I, it, it would be remiss of me not to say officers have provided information to, to deal with those aspects. Thank you for that, Gary. I think we, we've also got to be reminded that when we sit here and we actually look at a, a proposal that we put forward what our views and opinions are. And I think that when we've got a deprived community such as Connorsville, which has got health inequalities, that even uh, parts of the air quality that's negligible, it does make an impact. That we do have the infrastructure that's not there. This is, as the word used, colossal uh, development in that community if it maybe been stretched over a certain length of time it wouldn't have had the impact that we fear that it would have now so i, I fully support the recommendation that's been made by uh, uh, councillor anderson uh, councillor dickerson you put your hand up <coughs> yeah it was just a point on drainage although they say the surface water it will be reduced there is still some that is going to come down isn't there 
Yeah. So although be, there is still some, so why I don't understand why we can't go on drainage. I think that's because when they explained it, it's um, because it doesn't make the, the saying it doesn't make it any worse is what they said within there. If it was um, impacted on it negatively, I think that's it, it. Like I say, it's very difficult. I mean, all the area's been flooding. So we have got a motion, and it's, I think everybody's still there. I'll be for me to um, uh, try to dissuade members, but I just want to reiterate what Gary has said. Um, I think we'd be on wobbly ground in an appeal on these reasons. Again, I'd strongly advise you, as Gary has, to drop this, the last part of the reason for refusal about it being a departure from the development plan. Appreciate the hopefully dense point, but I don't think it, I think it's too far to say it's a departure because it isn't. Um, so I don't know whether you want to keep the density point, but maybe not not the second part. Um, but yeah, as I say, my advice is that these are not reasons which are defendable in an appeal scenario, and it's incumbent upon me to advise the committee of that. Uh, Councillor Stapleton, you want to come back? Because I think you also heard the overdevelopment, but what? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if one of the other reasons could be cumulative impact, just based on the information I've got from the local plan. A total of 528 properties, indicative, I get it, so that means we're going to end up with 20% more, which is an extra 100 odd houses, potentially, if we go on the indicative. Um, so, you know, the potential community altogether. Yeah, that one. Um, impact, is that potentially a, a, another reason? That I, I personally think it is. The, the cumulative impact to the, the, the community of Coningsborough um, by allowing this to go through would be wrong. Just so I'm clear, cumulative impact in, in terms of can you just can you just explain to me what you mean by cumulative? The number impact? of the houses that have been identified as part of the local plan, whilst they understand it's indicative, 528 new homes have been allocated within the zones uh, in the local plan for Coningsborough. So if every one of them gets that extra 20% across the board, that's an extra 100 houses. Well, 100 and I wrote it down somewhere, 110, I think it was. So or 101. So you, you end up, so we end up with 630 odd houses in Conrad, not 528. That's a hell of a big difference between the local plan and what we end up with. So the, I think there's a community altogether effect that's based upon, sorry, I can't say it, Gary stole my words. Um, I think there's a community effect, there was, said it there, um, of that and what's been identified in the local plan. And we do have to refer to local plan as a guide, I get that. And it does carry weight. So to me, that does carry some weight of cumulative effect. Yeah, I, I don't know what Gary's views are on this, but I, I think it's dangerous to try and um, involve what what the overall allocation for Connorsborough is in the determination of this um, application. Um, as Gary advised you, there is no upper limit on that. So I, I'm not keen on that. I don't know if Gary has a different view. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think you have, you've got to stick to the merits of this application, which is if if you're concerned about things like density, flood risk, uh, impact of this development on uh, healthcare, dentistry, those kind of things, then then it's confined to this application. I think it would be a bit of a stretch to then say, as a result of this development, that all other allocations or all of all of the sites are expected to have an uplift of um, an additional blanket ten or twenty percent because the site constraints might not allow for that uplift. So I think you've got you've got to be minded to deal with this application on its merits is what I would say. So I'd probably look to drop that, if I'm being honest. Can I just come back to that, Chair? I mean, you're saying about uh, future developments won't, you know, mindful that they, they won't potentially get that extra 20%. When you look at the calculations that I've just done looking at the other side, and I know that's not part of determination where we've done that bit, so we're now on to the reason for refusal. Um, when we're looking at the other site in, in, in the area, you know, the, the amount of space, 198 point square metres per dwelling on the indicative numbers for that site compared to um, uh, 180 square metres per dwelling if we had the 200 on that site, but we've actually got 150.86 square metres with the proposal. So therefore, if we were to look at the other site, ended up with a little bit more, 5%, 10%, and when you look at that, the cumulative effects that again now could there. The cumulative effect of that is putting a considerable more number of houses into Con potentially into Coningsborough than what the local plan has actually indicated. 
that, that's been agreed on. Now, bear in mind, and I think this is to consider, the local plan took green belt land. It took green belt land out and allowed to, it to be developed. Now, whether we agree or disagree is irrelevant to this, but it took green belt land out. We need to make sure if we're going to do that, that we do the best thing, not create something that, that is so, to me, is overpopulated and has such a massive effect on the local community that it's, it's not, it doesn't have the value of taking it out of green belt. Does that make sense? It, it's not giving us value, or well, giving the community value, which is more important. So, whilst I understand exactly what you're saying, Gary, and, and, and I know maybe I'm an old fashioned person, but I just look at this in the whole, the, 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 the local plan does have weight. We know that because we keep being told it. It does have weight. How much weight? That's down for you guys and the other people sitting on panel to, to, to work out. But, but as it stands there, I'm very concerned that, that if we ignore the cumulative effect of what's happening now and other potential developments, we could end up in a situation further down the line with 100, 200 houses more than we actually put in the local plan, which basically makes this local plan a complete waste of paper. Thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, I think it's difficult to draw in other sites because the site constraints might dictate that you might, for example, you might get a lower number uh, based upon tree retention or biodiversity net gain, or there's a flood attenuation pond that needs to go in. Or so th there's a lot of constraints that might dictate a different number to what is actually indicatively shown. So indicatively, is as it suggests, it's a it's a, a number to feed into a bigger number, which gives us our five-year deliverable housing supply. On the basis of that, we're able to then to report to government to say, we've fulfilled our statutory function, which is that we've got enough sites to meet demand over the next five years, which then means that we can re refuse or resist development sites that are in inappropriate lo locations, such as in the green belt of the countryside that haven't been then allocated. The, the risk obviously is if we start refusing allocated sites and they don't come forward and we're not meeting our housing supply uh, and demand requirements is that they will start becoming under pressure for these sites in other in other locations um, but in terms of your point on cumulative impact I think it's it would be it'd be risky to try and add that into a, a reason for refusal because I, I don't think it would stand up um, because the, the first question that the inspector would say was how do you know what the what the final number is going to be on that and how can that then feed into a cumulative impact if you don't know what the number is going to be. Okay, are we happy then we take that part out and leave the remaining? How do you feel? Uh, I'm happy to take officer's advice on that if you are, Gary. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so do you want to put your proposal forward again and we'll get it seconded and go for a vote. Okay, so move that we reject the proposal on the basis that the impact on air quality will be significant and we are not convinced that the uh, travel plan management strategy will uh, have the impact that it's intended to. And are you seconding that again? Okay, can we have showing the band then in favour of this proposal? Okay, that's all in favour. Right, we're going to second that just, one more. Can we just, sorry, while we were just comparing, um, it occurs to us that we need to add some policies to this. We need to um, add a list of policies. So can, can, we, can it just be agreed that that part of the decision is deferred to the development management team to add on as part of the... Yeah, that's exactly. Right. <coughs> okay, so uh, the proposal was moved, it was seconded, and it was rejected. Thank you for that. Application. Before we go to application two, does anybody need a toilet break? Okay, so it is now 15.29, so at 15.40, you've got 10 minutes, so please be back on time. Agreed? Okay, and we're back. <laughs> okay, application number two is planning application 22 oblique 01377 oblique FULM, which is direction of 10 dwellings of the land of Goodison Boulevard, Cantley in Doncaster. Mel Roberts is the planning case officer and he'll introduce this item. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, pre-committee amendments, just really to let you know there's some speakers. Councillor Steve Cox will be speaking. Uh, we've got Mr Lee Murden uh, from 
the public speaking against, and we've got Matthew Clarkson and Adam Goldsmith speaking in favour. So uh, this is a 100% affordable rented housing scheme on a council-owned site for 10 dwellings, which comprise bungalows and dormer bungalows. Uh, we've got the site plan there. Uh, so the existing access off Goodison Boulevard that served the former care home on this site is to be used to serve five of the, d of the dwellings off, the, off a private drive. You can just see that uh, coming off Goodison Boulevard there at the bottom. Um, and then you've got another private drive uh, proposed at the northwestern corner of the site off Brettbury Close, which you can see there in the top left-hand corner. Uh, that will serve an additional two dwellings. And then the remaining three dwellings have direct access onto Brettbury Close itself. This layout has pretty much been designed to ensure that all trees on site are retained and you can see those there on the on the site plan. And these trees will form part of the amenity space to serve the development and these are primarily at the southern end of the site as you can see there uh, close to Goodison Boulevard and then also at the northern end of the site there uh, and you can see the amenity spaces where the trees are. This is an aerial photo but I must uh, advise that this is it is a bit old because it is showing the former care home on the site which is no longer there but I just thought it'd be useful just to, for you to see what was on site before its demolition. It's also worth noting that the surrounding area is residential in nature as you can see from that image. Just a couple of photos of the site, really, because it's not a great deal to see, but this is the access that's going to be utilised again to, to form the private drive access that I mentioned, and this was the former access into the care home um, when it was the care home. Uh, and then this is just another photo showing the site itself, which is fairly <laughs> flat um, with, with, with mature trees on, on the boundary. So in terms of the principle, it, the site lies within the residential policy area as allocated in the local plan and so is acceptable in principle. It lies within the main urban area which is the focus for growth. It's previously developed land given the care home on there. And it also lies close to facilities and public transport provision. It will also provide the type of affordable housing that is much needed in this area. In terms of design, um, the scheme has been designed to ensure that there are no issues with overlooking of surrounding residential properties. All the properties meet national design space standards and have sufficient rear garden space. These are uh, just the house types. There are four different house types proposed. Uh, as you can see here, the dormers and, and bungalows. Just a visual impression for you. This is looking uh, at the junction of Brettbury Close and Goodison Boulevard. And you can see from that image that there's quite an attractive frontage to the site with uh, brick piers forming the entrance. And then you've got low railings and, and hedging to, to sort of soften the, the development. All other issues such as highways, drainage and contamination have been resolved. And the proposal also achieves over 10% biodiversity net gain. There's quite high sustainability of the properties. They will all have air source heat, heat pumps together with electrical, electric vehicle charging and photovoltaics on the roof, as you can see from that diagram. There have been a number of objections to the application stating that this land should be retained as open space uh, and that's to compensate for the loss of open space as a result of the care home that's been built to the west of Brettby Close, which you can see on that image there. It's actually called Liberty House. Um, so that was, a, that was approved some years ago on, on an area of open space. However, I would advise members that this is not a material planning consideration as that application for the care home on the open space was determined on its own merits. Um, and it was decided that the care home outweighed the loss of open space and that was approved and has no bearing on this application. This site is not allocated as open space and so there'd be no policy basis for insisting that it remains open space. As I've said previously, it lies within the residential policy area and therefore is suitable for residential development. 
So in summary, the site is sustainable, is suitable for residential development as it lies within the residential area in the local plan. It lies within the main urban area, which is a focus for growth. It's previously developed land, it's in a sustainable location and provides the type of affordable housing that is needed in this area. So it's therefore recommended that planning permission be granted. Thank you for that, Mel. We've got Councillor Steve Cox, who was the ward member and requested to speak in opposition to the application. It's now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone when you finish your submission. And I'll let you know you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. I'll start by giving a bit of background information. The start of this applica the application came to Council in 2016 to build a new nursing home. <coughs> on, sorry, on the open site on Goodson Boulevard to replace the old one that sat... Oh, my God, you read it. Sorry. Just bear with me, because I've not read it. I'll start right, back I'm just back. not sure how did it stand across all this. No, time. sorry. I'll, I'll Councillor I'll Cox, if you don't mind. Pardon? Right. Go on. Thank I'll you. read his words. The my yeah. words. I'll start by giving you a bit of background information. The staff of this application came to council in 2016 to build a new nursing home on the open space on Goodison Boulevard to replace the old one that was sat on the site to, to which this application refers to. Officers pressured us to give them support, which caused us concern, as we, we wanted this to be built. We wanted the nursing home to be built on a site in Rosington. One of the issues at this time was loss of green open space, and we've been told when discussing the land valuation between this piece of land and the parcel of land at Gatson House in Rosington that the, the value of both pieces of land was the same. This wasn't true, and we called that decision in. We went through the 106 documents in detail, and we found that play equipment should have been provided on the site where the nursing home now stands. Also, £30,000 to be paid for a sports coach. These funds have now been made, they made their way to Cantley Park to build the skate park there. We have had many meetings in the past regarding the applications for this site. A zebra crossing should have been installed before the nursing home was opened. We're still waiting for that to happen. So there's actually no safe way of going from Liberty House across the way. So there'd be no safe way for, to get from this application across to the co-op and the amenities. We've been told that lack of, lack of open space would not happen due to the, the, this land. The land this application relates to will be given back to the ward for gre a green open space. But obviously this application has gone in. Now we're told that only, the only green open space is available over the road. This, the green open space over the road is at Grange Fields, which is actually a private play park. We've, um, we attended a meeting with the owner of this land and he doesn't want to give it over to the council and he obviously wants the residents to fund any repairs to this uh, green space. The green space audit shows there is shortage of informal children's play areas with our section of Bessica and Cantley. This has been mitigated by the playground over the road. Why should the residents of Grainfield Estate have to prop up every application when it is their private park funded by themselves? It was a condition in the 2016 application that an enhanced area of open space is required to help offset the loss of open space because of the care home. Also, the care home shall not be occupied until a zebra crossing has been provided on Goodison Boulevard in accordance with scheme previously approved in writing by the local planning authority. The reason to provide a safe crossing for occupants on the care home and for people wanting to access the area of open space on the opposite side of Goodison Boulevard. No enhanced open space, no zebra crossing. The residents of County 6 have lost not only the greens open space to an 83 bed home, but are now seeing that a recommendation to grant another 10 homes on the open space has, that was recommended to replace the loss of open space. There's a lot of open space going on here. We're also aware of the stress the residents of Grangefield area are feeling when the park facilities are full and there's no one for their children to play. Policy 28 of the local plan states that a development of properties between 10 and 20 family homes will be supported in developing open space. I can see open space on the proposed development, but nothing to replace that the, res that, that the residents of County 6 estate have lost. We have an estate that has hundreds of residents with no play equipment at all. There is a basketball hoop in the middle of a car park that states no ball games. We have a picture of that if required. The only green open space they had was taken from them for the nursing home, and now the parcel of land is, is, is returning to housing. 
Policy 44 of the local plan states layout and street design will result in attractive landscape public realm, which includes community focal spaces that foster social interaction and create an inclusive, safe and secure environment for people and property. We have seen that in the public realm this has been lost due to the application in 2016 and the application directly to private, it directs residents to a privately funded playground. What happens when the company who run this privately funded playground immediately wants One to remove the playground? Me. One minute. Is, if, there's a, if there's anything they can do with the mugger, the residents, of the, all the, area, the residents in the area will have lost everything. We are all aware of the shortage of housing in Doncaster. The building of it shouldn't be to the detriment of the residents that already live in the area. If the committee decide to grant this application, we would ask that a condition is stated that play, play equipment is installed within County 6 estate on the tarmac area behind Limpool that is already marked on the drawing as a playground. It's just currently tarmac. Please let's give the residents something back for all they have lost over the past five years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions that we'd like to ask Councillor Cox? Councillor Anderson? Could you expand a little on the privately owned playground? I didn't quite catch the specifics of it. Yeah, so sort of the sorry. ownership and the who's paying for it. Do you want me to answer? Yeah, you will, yeah. The, pri the privately owned, owned playground is it's owned by the, a, a derivative of the company that built the, the estate, Bellway. Uh, the, it's, the company's called Meadfleet. And what they do is the they, the residents of Grangefield play a, an amount of money for the maintenance of that playground. And what they've seen over time, because it, this money, don't, it, it don't last forever equipment. So what they saw is a mugger that was taken down. There were no, there were no fences around it at all. We were out and about at that time. Uh, we'd, we'd seen a ball go in front of a, a, a bus where a kid stepped in front of the bus to get it. So subsequently, we tried to do something about it. We ended up with a meeting with the, the director of Maidfleet that basically said, don't care. But they did, after going to court, they ended up, they, they reinstalled it, but they charged the residents again for reinstalling it. The residents have been charged for um, chippings, all kinds of things, depreciation of computers in, in Maidfleet's office, cars, all sorts. And what's happening is that now the mugger's only got one net in it, one, one place where they can play football. So you've got residents that are paying for it, but can't use it generally because there's already somewhere in it. The land over the road within the 106 states that there should have been provision for children's play in that. But when we tried to find the 106 at the beginning, we were told that it's archived. I found it. And I put it in, we were in a meeting, I took it to that meeting, and then it was just like, well, we don't care anymore. If we're doing what we're doing. And now it's all been to the detriment of the residents of County 6 and to the residents of, of Grangefield, because they're paying for something that is either gets damaged, they have to pay for it, they pay a lot for it, or the residents of, of County 6 have got nothing at all. And, and it's straight across the road. It, it's just, it, it just stinks. Thank you for the council of I do think we have to be mindful that we, um, like I said, it's not a material consideration for this application, so we have to remember the two are not connected. Uh, do we have any other questions? Councillor Bob Anderson. Yep, Steve, just so I can get a better understanding of the where the Liberty House was built, that green space, what was there before? Was there a part there or anything before, or was it just... It was open green space, and it, it was highlighted in in um, a pre, in previous documents as being for a play area, and activities had taken place on that on that space before. For some strange reason, and we don't know why, there were never any play equipment put on there, but it was an open space for for kids to play on, and kids did play on it. Um, we've we've been told years past that they've had fairs, galas, all kinds of things on there. And now they've got nothing. They've got nowhere. Okay. Thank you for that, Councillor Council Anderson. I am going to remind again, it's not a material consideration because that's not the application. That was one that's already been uh, passed and delivered. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, just for a bit of background, just looking on the aerial photograph, 
I don't, I don't know Cantley very well. Um, opposite that, that land on Goodison Boulevard, next door to the community centre, um, is a play park. Is that the private one that we're talking about? Okay, thank you. Was there a question there, Councillor Stapleton, for Councillor Cox? Sorry. The, I, the question it, was, is that the private one that you referred to? And I said yes. Okay. Sorry. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Cox. Okay, we've got Mr Lee Murden, which is a member of the public, which requested to speak in opposition to the application. Would like to come down to the front. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone when you finish your submission and we'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Good afternoon. I've uh, got a few apologies first because there's, there's about 15 people who are also share my op opposition um, but for work and childcare restraints. So uh, Louise Reed, Lee Pugh, Lindsay Wood, Natalie Simpson, Karen Murden, Tim Piggott, Julie Vowles, Kerry Keehan, Del Wynn, Aaron Zelinsky, Leah diaz Manonka, Emma McClue, Jeanette Wright, Angie Piggott, Peter Gibson, George Edson and Maria Griffiths. So apologies they can't be here. Um, I'm going to begin by showing a, a photo here. Um, I can't quite put it on the big screen, I haven't got digital, but if, um, if everybody can't see it, I will describe. And what this is, this is um, like a makeshift football pitch, what some local children have made at the side of a very busy road where buses, what Steve alluded to. And the reason why they've done that is they haven't got anywhere to play. There is a deficiency of green space, play, play equipment in that area. And they've set up a football pitch, again, I'll show you this, at the side of the road. So when we're discussing about outweighing the need for green space and a care home, what is it gonna take for someone to get a, hit by a bus before we can consider what needs to be done there. There is a huge, huge deficiency of open space, play areas for children in that area. And just for the record, this was, um, this was set up about four weeks after the, um, the green area, what Steve alluded to, was fenced off uh, for the development to begin. So it, it, it occurred, it was set up pretty much immediately after that green area was fenced off. The area we're talking about is about three acres, and I am struggling to not bring it up when we're, we're talking about, we've got to look at this specific area here. This area gives everybody here, the members, the opportunity to address the lack of green space in that area, meaningful play area for children. If you overlook it and develop it, build houses, something terrible will happen. A no ball game sign will not stop the children playing football at the side of the road. I've got here in writing, this is from the planning consultation response from the, play, um, from the care home. It also highlights that there is a deficiency of green space and suitable play area for children. That will get worse as a result of the care home being built. The trade-off for the loss of green space was a footpath and a zebra crossing, of which the zebra crossing is not there. That was never made. The leftover space at the side adjacent, which may I add, is larger in area than the play area, which is the privately funded one. That area, which is larger, was deemed not valuable to turn into a children's play area. So why would a smaller area be deemed acceptable to fit that whole area? And again, I have, um, I've, I've got it on the map. This is, uh, this is the area on Goodison, which is 0.22 kilometer squared. Sorry, a circumference. This is 0.28 kilometer in circumference. So the area deemed not suitable for children's play area is greater than the one that is.
I urge, I urge the planning team and members to reconsider scrapping this whole development and putting meaningful play, play suitable area there, green space, there's trees there. That is what it should be for the people of Cantley. One minute remaining. And again, just um, I am one of the people who unfortunately has to pay for the park to be repaired. We have seen an overwhelming amount of vandalism, use, accelerated damage on that area as a direct result of kids having nowhere else to go. I don't believe the local authority put any funding to help cater for that accelerated wear, damage. There's just nothing there. So to summarize, what we'd like and the people I speak on behalf of is, is one of two things, preferably both is one, a proper park, a proper play area for the children on this site here, instead of the dormer bungalows, which to be fair, there's only 10. It's not really fulfilling a huge, huge need. Um, don't get me wrong, I think if you put 50, 60, 70 houses there, that, that would enhance the problem. So for us, the local people, the people on the doorstep, the people who it is really affecting, that is what it needs to be, open space. And secondly, finally, the council, we wish that they will fund and contribute towards the repairs at Grangefields, that privately owned park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your submission. Uh, do we have any questions that we'd like to ask? No? Thank you very much for your submission. We now have Mr. Matthew Clarkson and Mr. Adam Goldsmith. The applicants have requested to speak in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes collectively. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone when you've concluded your submission and we'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. Um, in respect to the former Plantation View site, um, so the application before committee today is for the approval to deliver 10 um, two and three bedroom bungalows. It's a cleared brownfield site and it will meet the identified housing need for the local area. Cabinet approved the scheme um, on the 22nd of June, 22, and it also follows the cabinet decision um, referred to by um, Councillor Cox, which was in October, 2016, um, where the decision was taken to, to decant the residents of the former home on this site, to demolish the former care home and to develop the site for housing. Um, it was on the 4th of October, 2016. Um, it's always been clear that the site was going to be brought forward for housing. I'm not sure where any kind of suggestions ever been made that it would be for public open space. Absolutely not. Um, so basically the scheme forms part of phase two of the council's ambitious um, three-phase housing development program which will deliver um, in phase two around 123 new homes ranging from one bed flats to five bedroomed houses um, and includes 45 bungalows that are included within this site. All the sites are brownfield, um, they're creating um, an additional four hectares thereabouts of underused um, land back into use, creating um, an additional 0.9 hectares of landscaped open space across the seven sites as well. Funding for the scheme is sourced through the housing revenue account and it's supported by a grant from both um, the Brownfield Housing Fund and we're in conversation with Homes England to get additional grant from the Affordable Homes Programme to support the financial viability of the schemes. Um, the specification for the new homes is higher than the usual market standards. It exceeds the current building regulations and we're working towards the proposed 2025 future home standard. The properties built in part of this phase will be the first off-gas homes delivered by the programme, designed with high energy efficiency, space and adaptability standards, and is designed using a landscape-led approach that aims to support biodiversity and nature recovery. Um, as far as possible under the viability constraints of the affordable housing model. The properties have got enhanced construction standards, for example, integrated photovoltaic, so photovoltaic solar panels, larger cavities to maximise insulation capacity, 
moisture resistant plasterboard in the kitchens and the bathrooms to help minimize the risk of damp, mold and condensation. And they'll all have electric vehicle charging points. The intention is the additional measures will ensure energy costs are minimized for residents and support the council's ambitions to address fuel poverty and support improvements to residents' health and wellbeing. All homes will be managed by St Ledger Homes and allocated to those on the housing registry using the choice-based lettings process in accordance with local lettings policies. Thank you. Do we have any questions that we'd like to ask? No? Thank you very much for your submission. Right, committee members, we're now going to go into debate. Does any member wish to come on the report and ask the case officer a question? No? Okay, therefore, is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to conditions? I'm going to move it. Do I have a second for that proposal? That's been seconded. Can we have a show of hands in support of the application, please? Any abstentions? Against? That's one against, so that proposal is passed. Application number three, planning application two two of the zero one two two eight of the three FULM, which is the erection of forty eight dwellings ranging from one bedroom apartments to five bedroom homes, work to include new road infrastructure connecting to Cedar Road, new public open space, and other landscaping associated works at the site of the former Nightingale School, Cedar Road Bowling, Doncaster. This is going to be presented to us by Jess Duffield, the planning case officer. Hi everyone, thanks Chair. As Chair just described, this application is, is similar to uh, one you've just seen as part of the Council's um, housing build programme. Uh, this is an allocated housing site in the local plan. 48 dwellings, which are all going to be 100% affordable rent. This application has received a total of eight neighbour representations, which I'll touch on slightly later. The site itself, it sits on Cedar Road in Balby. Uh, it was historically used as a school up until 2003, and then was used as Ashworth Barracks Museum up until 2019. Since then, and more recently, the site has been cleared, as you can see on this picture of what it formerly looked like and what it looks like now. The site itself is surrounded by residential properties in all directions and is considered to be relatively well connected. There's local amenities located on Wormsworth Road within walking distance of the site, as well as Mallard Primary School and a larger area of public open space, as you can see on the map there. The site benefits from an existing access, which was previously uh, served those, those uses I just mentioned, and as you can see as well, the site's well connected in terms of the A1 junction to, to amenities further afield. The development surrounding the site consists of a mixture of residential houses, including semi-detached houses, detached and bungalows, as you can see there. In this regard, the site is considered to be located in a sustainable location. In terms of the allocation itself, as you can see there, it's, it's um, labelled under the reference of MUA 62 in the local plan, and which has an indicative capacity of up to 49 houses. In all of the right directions, the site's covered by, um, sorry, the surrounding site's covered by the residential policy area, and there's also some um, protected areas of open space, those ones I've just mentioned. The proposal in front of us uh, consists of 48 dwellings, which are a mixture of different house types, including semis, bungalows, and terraces. It also includes quite a generous area of public open space, and the houses are a mixture of one bedroom flats right through to five bedroom houses. The properties all meet the NDDS standards, which are set out in policy 45 of the local plan, with 39 of the properties meeting the M42 accessible ad adaptability criteria and three meeting M43, which is the wheelchair user properties. Um, I'm just going to flick through some of the house types here really quickly just to give you an indication of the mixture of properties we are looking at on this site. So as you can see, we've got some four bedroom properties, five bedroom one, 
the one bedroom masonette style apartment. So whilst they are apartments, they sort of appear as two bedroom, sort of two storey properties. They're the only properties which don't benefit from parking directly outside. But as you can see, I've indicated there the maximum distance from that uh, rear access gate to the furthest space is 14 metres. And as well as all the other properties, that even in that parking courtyard, there will be all the EV charging facilities. Touching on uh, the types of house types again, so we've got some bungalows, dormer bungalows, and again, I've just indicated on the plan there sort of the mixture of the properties across the site to uh, create a well balanced community. Two bedroom, uh, two story houses. So, all the properties like I can mention have off street parking availability. The two bedroom properties do have a slightly lower um, availability of parking, but that meets the criteria for. Um, sort of the demand for these properties, so not all two bedroom properties on council housing sites require two off street spaces. So it's quite a mixture, I just wanted to show that. In addition to the, um, the housing, there's quite a generous proportion of public open space on this site, so overall the site contributes 22.95% of the site as, as public open space, which includes the private orchard area shown in that centre image there which has been labelled as Nightingale Orchard. That area will be um, gated off for residents only. So excluding that area in terms of actual overall public open space, it's 18.8%, which accords with the local plan policy. Tree officer has no objection to this proposal and note there's a, uh, the development will require the removal of some low amenity trees and um, moderate amenity trees in the centre of the site. But the one TPO tree, which is sort of on the um, boundary, I've highlighted that in a second, will be retained. Um, the POS is considered to be located in, in um, well surveyed, surveyed areas, so there are windows on houses overlooking all these public open spaces just to make sure that that's um, safe. And obviously, I've pointed out there is a larger public open space with, um, within sort of less than a minute walk up the site. In terms of drainage, there are no objections in reg uh, from either the Yorkshire Water, our internal drainage officers, or the Environment Agency. The site's in flood zone one, and relevant conditions have been attached in this regard. Policy 30 of the local plan requires all sites to provide a 10% um, provision of biodiversity net gain, either on site or where it cannot be provided on site, should be accommodated um, off site through financial contributions. This site uh, has an output of minus 37.11% and therefore is, does not, is not considered to meet policy 30. However, due to the viability of the scheme and the fact that it's 100% affordable housing, this is considered to be acceptable on balance. The social benefits of the site in terms of it being 100% affordable housing is considered to outweigh the harm in terms of ecology habitats. The site itself has got quite a few environmental features which are not required um, through the current building control regulations, such as the inclusion of solar panels on every property, an air source heat pump on each property, as well as a thermal store cylinder. There's also a condition attached regarding EV charging, which is a condition 19, and each property like said, it has a dedicated EV charging point. So just to conclude, this application is for 4,800% affordable housing um, units. It also includes a generous on-site public open space contribution as well as a private orchard area for future residents. The site utilises an existing brownfield site which is currently cleared within a residential area. It's an allocated housing site and the design officer also has no um, concerns regarding separation distances or the design of the, of the layout. Just want to show some site, site photographs of the site itself. It's currently all fenced off since it's been cleared, so it's not currently accessible to the public. And you can see those sort of moderate amenity trees in the centre there. Oh, I have, I have got some visuals as well, but they're not showing for some reason, but I can grab them up in a second while we, while we get those. That's the end for now, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, we've got Mrs. Carol Hedley. She's a member of the public that's requested to speak in opposition to the application. Would you like to come down to the front? This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and then again when you finish your submission and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say, first of all, I'm not opposed to the plans as a whole. I just wanted to comment about some changes I have tried to put forward. Um, when I first went to the meeting at St Peter's Church Hall for the very first consultation, I did mention that we live on Rally Terrace um, and I wanted bungalows preferably, preferably behind our property rather than houses. Um, as I say, I live on Rally Terrace in a bungalow which backs onto the site in the northeast corner. Our garden is quite wide, so we would be overlooked by three plots, 29, 28 and 27. These are semi-detached houses and one of a run of four dormer bungalows. They all have upstairs windows directly overlooking our property. Our garden is not long, so our lounge, dining room and bedroom windows are fairly cl close to the boundary fence. I feel that this will invade our privacy as we have French windows on one side of our lounge wall that is looking directly at where plot 29 will be. Our bedroom window and dining room window would be overlooked by plot 28 and the window on the back of our lounge would be overlooked by plot 27. We feel that wherever we are in the rooms in the back of our property we would have no privacy. Also the height of the roofs will affect the light in our garden thus affecting the light inside our bungalow. At the moment, all we see over the fence is sky and trees and all we hear are birds. As plot 29 is planned to be the five-bedroomed house, which is the biggest on the site, um, it's obviously for a large family and probably be noisy. I find it strange that it will be surrounded by existing neighbouring bungalows. All my neighbours in, in Rally Terrace, where we live, are retired in the bungalows. Also on the north side, there is St Thomas's Close, which are also bungalows. We're all used to living in a very quiet environment. I did comment about this, as I said, in St Peter's Church Hall last April. I spoke to the three men that were there, but no one wanted to answer my questions. I was told to put a comment on the planning application um, when it went on the internet. I also spoke to Jessica Duffield uh, more than once on the telephone and asked if anything could be done about the changes. Uh, and I was told that she couldn't comment on, the, on what I'd put on the internet and I could air uh, my views at this meeting. As you've probably seen, I suggested that they move the semi-detached properties proposed for plot 28 and 29 across to the west side of the site, backing onto the proposed orchard. This would then not invade anyone's privacy or peace and quiet. They could then move the semi-detached mobility bungalows that are there plot 38 and 39 behind our property near to existing bungalows. If this was done, we would only be overlooked by plot 27 and just see the roofs of plot 28 and 29, which would help us with losing light and privacy and also be less noisy. We didn't want this site to be changed at all. We thought it would always be a school or educational premises due to the covenant of the Batty Wrights and family stating that the land would always be used for educational purposes. Obviously, that covenant is no longer, it no longer applies. I made two comments on the planning application. The second one was regarding the trees and shrubbery behind our property on the northeast corner of the boundary. In what will be the garden of proposed plot 29 are four very large Leyland Diconifers. They're approximately eight metres high and have never been trimmed. We're concerned that when the site is completed, the trees will be left and just get worse, stopping even more light. I'm concerned about the main sewer in that area as well, due to the roots of the trees. One minute remaining. Thank you. I've rang the council about this, but been told there's nothing that can be done. Directly behind our boundary fence, there's also dense vegetation, brambles, bindweed, woodley trees, and other bunch of bushes that we've had to pay a gardener to cut back. And I'm also worried this will still be there when the site is finished. We moved to a bungalow, so we wouldn't have as much gardening to do, but have ended up having to sort out the bushes and things from that site. The planning of the site to social housing has caused my husband and myself much anxiety to the point of looking at moving house, which we really don't want to do. I'd just like you to think about the points I've made and hopefully make some changes. Thank you. Thank you. That's the only other committee you'd like to ask Ms. Edley a question. Thank you for your time. We now have Mr Matthew Clarkson and Mr Adam Goldsmith, the applicant, requested to speak in support of the application.
This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes collectively. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone when you've concluded your submission and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you Chair. So the application before committee today is for the approval of um, 48 homes ranging from the one bed apartments through to the larger five bed house um, on a cleared brownfield site to meet housing need. Um, cabinet approval for the scheme was received again on the 22nd of June 2022 and this scheme as well forms part of the council's um, larger build programme. What I won't, they all form part of it and they all form, they, they're all part of the existing programme. I'm, I'm assuming I don't need to, to go through what the benefits of the wider programme are in respect of each application or, or do I need to do that? No, I think you should be fine. Thank you. So basically we, we, we're looking at again at an off um, gas development, looking at the energy efficiency benefits that are going to be promoted through um, the enhanced construction standards and specifications. All of this is around looking at ensuring that the energy costs for residents are minimised. Um, what we have tried to do as part of the wider development is acknowledge um, some of either the questions and concerns that have been raised in respect of the layout of the property. Um, the lady who has just spoken, the Leylandite, aren't actually um, in our site. They're actually in a neighbour's garden, which is why we're not able to um, do anything in respect of those. Um, the, the, the layout has been considered with the mobility um, units located towards the front of the site. So it's not, the, there's reasoning behind where the properties are located. Um, it's, it's, it's with a, a lot of thought given to that in respect to, to access. Um, again, the homes will all be managed by St Ledger Homes and allocated to those on the housing register um, using the choice based letting system. It's also proposed that um, looking at some of the kind of military um, connections in respect to the sites that some of the allocations will be put through to um, veterans in respect of this um, as and when the need arises. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions? No? Thank you for your submission. Yeah? Um, you're probably not aware of this, but I know this site extremely well. Um, I'm the person that developed Ashworth Barracks Museum. Um, do you know about the air raid shelter? Happy to discuss it with you later where it is, because and you won't find it till you start digging, but the potential large void. Sorry, Chair, I just thought I'd take the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for that. You like to throw a spanner in, don't you, Gary? <laughs> Did you like to throw a spanner in? <laughs> okay. Um, Since so no other questions, shall we go into debate? Is there any questions to the officer? Councillor Beach. Yes. Um, Jess said in her um, presentation that two of the properties haven't got an EV charging pot point directly, it's a, a little way away. Um, yes, the electric's connected. How how will these be used in the sense of um, when they plug in, do they have to put money in the slot or a credit card or something? Um, whereas, in other words, who's paying for the electric? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have raised this with the applicants themselves, and they will say they'll be connected to sort of each plot. I'm happy for them to go into a bit more. They did. They did pick that up and say that's all sort of been covered. It's not. It comes out of the um, connected to each property. Councillor Hans. Given the concerns that uh, Mrs. Hadley raised, can you confirm that uh, separation distances and overlooking and uh, loss of light have all been taken into consideration in the normal way? Yeah, so I do pick up on the neighbour's calls and um, I have obviously spoken to her on the phone quite a few times and I, I acknowledge her concerns regarding the proximity between those plots you can see on the side there and her, her property. Um, the pro like I said, the properties behind her her house are dormer bungalows. I did go directly to the urban design officer and raised her query with them and the suggested moves, but as picked out by the applicants as well, um, the, the suggested sort of ones she wanted to swap them with next to the orchard are the mobility units which for obviously ease of access have been positioned right at the front of the site and rather than down the sort of little narrower private drive and yet all the separation distances are achieved between that front window on the dormer bungalow and her garden so it achieves the um, guidance of meeting 21 meters um, in terms of separation 
Thank you, Clever Clark. Councillor Stapleton, then Councillor B. Thank you, Chair. Jess, just to refresh my mind, in, in that um, northeast corner, uh, or sort of from about halfway, can you just confirm, because it's difficult to see from a photograph, that the red line area at the back, the side, topography is, is actually it's quite higher than the actual build. So the, the houses at the back actually would be higher than the, 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 the proposed site to be built. I think it's important to actually recognise that. If I'm, if I'm right, that there's no look to build up, it's actually the development is a lot lower. Yeah, so the properties, I'll just go back again to sort of this one, the ones you're referring to at the rear of the site is St. Thomas. And yeah, but as you can see that they're bungalows, so they are higher up, but they're bungalows there. And then just going back to that site there, as you can see the long way you're describing, that is mainly the public open space. There's only that one property at the top there, which is sort of been set nearer into the road. So any sort of overlooking um, sort of has been mitigated by the fact that they're bungalows to the rear of the site and that, that sort of top boundary has been uh, retained as the main public open space. Thank you for that, Jess. Do we have any other questions? No? Wonderful. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to conditions? Is there a mover, please? I'll move. Move. Seconder, please. Thank you. Commissioner Vance, those in favour of the recommendation? That's unanimous, so that's passed. Thank you for that. Okay, we're going to go on to application number four, which is application 22 oblique 01427 oblique 3 FULM, which is the erection of 21 dwellings and associated infrastructure, including a mix of two, three, and four bedroom two story houses and bungalows with a communal central park area at DMBC Archive, King Edward Road in Bowlby. Andrea Sudders is the planning case officer, which will introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just start with a couple of pre-committee amendments. Um, we've got an amended site layout and house type plans that have been submitted as these now include external render to some of the properties. We've got two speakers, Adam Goldsmith and Matthew Clarkson speaking in support. Um, so this is a, a council application on a council site, hence being um, presented to planning committee. The, the scheme's proposing 21 dwellings on the former DMBC archive site at King Edward Road. It's the old um, archives building and it was demolished in 2021. This application is part of the Council House Build Programme and it will provide 100% affordable housing. The application is proposing a total of 21 dwellings and associated infrastructure providing a mix of two, three, four bedroomed, two storey houses and bungalows with a communal central park area. So residential developments are acceptable in principle because the site's allocated for residential use in the local plan. It's got an indicative site capacity for 15 dwellings. These photos show the site currently. It's the old archives building, which was demolished in 2021. The site's now grassy and overgrown. There are no trees on this site. The top photograph is viewed from the corner of Victoria Road and Florence Avenue. The top photograph, uh, sorry, the bottom left is the old access from Victoria Road and it's adjacent to number 47, um, Victoria Road. And the right-hand side photo is looking down Victoria Road. The character of the area comprises of terraced houses on King, Ed King Edward Road a combination of terraced and semi-detached houses on Victoria Road and semis on Florence Avenue to the north of the site. Um, you can see that the site has become quite grassy and overgrown and you can see the uh, to the right another access into the site from King Edward Road. Looking at the design and layout of the scheme, um, the application has been subject to informal pre-application advice and public consultation. Local residents were overall supportive of the layout, but concerns were raised regarding parking and traffic. The housing needs study carried out by the applicant identified the size of accommodation required in Balby, the requirement being a majority of two bedroom, four person houses and some three bedroom properties for the larger families on the waiting list. In addition to this, it was considered appropriate to provide some single level or bungalow type uh, pro properties. In terms of the site layout, 
The dwellings are outward facing onto Florence Avenue, King Edward Road and Victoria Road. Dwellings facing Victoria Road and Florence Avenue are set back from the road and this mirrors the dwellings opposite, while the dwellings facing King Edward Road are tied up to the footpath mirroring those opposite. Off-street parking has been provided for all of the properties. There's bungalows uh, which are proposed fronting Florence Avenue, whilst two-storey houses are proposed fronting King Edward Road and Victoria Road. There are no existing trees on site, but a, a landscaping scheme will be agreed by a condition. In terms of open space, um, a central park area has been created or will be created at the rear of properties fronting Victoria Road and King Edward Road. This area will be mainly hard landscaped but will contain shrub planting, seating areas and trees to be planted. This space will create a, a community space for neighbour interaction which will be accessed via King Edward Road. In terms of um, any objections, there's been one neighbour objection received. This has raised concerns regarding proximity of new dwellings, impact on amenity, parking and the potential for antisocial behaviour. In response to these concerns, there is no loss of amenity for any neighbours. The scheme meets local plan policies with respect to separation distances, therefore raising no amenity issues of, of overlooking or loss of light. The scheme provides off-street car parking for each dwelling. Any issues of antisocial behaviour would be addressed via other legislation. In addition, South Yorkshire Police has raised no objection. The application is in full accordance with local plan policies 42 and 44 in terms of design, layout, access and highway requirements. The Council's Urban Design Officer is supportive of the design and layout of the scheme. Moving on to house types, this shows a three-bedroomed, five-person semi or terraced house which was identified in the housing needs survey carried out for Balby. External materials will be agreed via condition but provisionally the materials across the site will be red facing brick, anthracite grey roof tiles and render will be used on some of the properties. This shows another uh, house type, a two bed three person bungalow. This bungalow you can see includes render. All properties meet nationally described internal space standards and local plan policy 45 in providing accessibility and adaptable dwellings. This slide shows the proposed visual of the site from the corner of Victoria Road and Florence Avenue. There's a, a choice of materials and it's, this has been an important consideration because the development will remain in the authority's ownership, therefore this needs to be resilient. And as mentioned previously, the proposed materials are red facing brick, and anthracite grey roof tiles um, and the use of render to some properties but the final materials will be agreed by condition. The properties have been designed to reduce their impact on the environment and to make the homes more sustainable. These comprise air source heat pumps, solar panels and EV charging points. Overall the design of the development is more contemporary than traditional but although the scale and form of development is generally in keeping with the existing area, officers consider that the development will make a positive contribution to the area. It should be noted that this contemporary design has been used successfully in other areas of the borough and it's also worth noting that the council's housing sites have also received national recognition and featured in uh, the Architects Journal on the high standards of housing design. Um, a couple of street scenes there proposed showing uh, Victoria Road and King Edward Road. You can see that the development takes into account the natural slope of the site towards Florence Avenue. With regards to Section 106 legal contributions, there's no education contribution required as there's enough capacity at Balby Central Academy Primary School and Astria Academy Secondary School. But the development does fall short of providing other contributions. Policy 28 requires 15% on-site public open space. This scheme is delivering 6.3% on-site public open space. There's also a slight shortfall in biodiversity net gain as required by policy 29. However, there is on-site biodiversity gain as agreed with the council's ecologist, which include enhancements um, comprising of integrated bat boxes, swift nest, nest boxes and hedgehog access holes. These enhancements would be secured by condition. 
So overall, this application is a balance of considerations. This is a council house build programme. It's reliant on grant funding with no further grant funding available for the scheme. Therefore, it cannot sustain any Section 106 contributions and wouldn't be viable with the contributions required. Officers consider that given these factors, there would be greater community benefit in assisting the delivery of these affordable homes by granting permission without any commuted sums. So, on balance, the officer recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Thank you for that. We've got Mr Matthew Clarkson and Mr Adam Goldsmith, the applicant, have requested to speak to support the application. It's now your opportunity to speak to the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again, to mute the microphone when you've completed your submission. And I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. So the site of the former archive site at King Edward Road in Bowlby, um, before committee today um, for approval of 21 homes, including the two-bed bungalows and two, three and four-bedroomed houses on a cleared brownfield site with the mix of properties designed to meet local housing need. The scheme was approved at Cabinet um, on the 22nd of June 2022 and forms part of the wider phase two of the Council's house building scheme. Funding um, has already been secured um, from the housing revenue account and again supported by the Brownfield Housing Fund through the South Yorkshire Merrill Combined Authority and we've been in discussion with Homes England around um, potential grant levels through their affordable homes programme to support the financial viability of the scheme which has been alluded to um, wouldn't be possible without that additional grant support. Again, the, ha the specification for the homes is higher than the usual market standards exceeding the current building regulations um, and working towards the proposed 2025 future home standard. Again, the properties will be um, off gas um, and are designed to ensure that um, energy costs are minimised for residents, um, supporting the council's ambitions to address fuel poverty um, and support improvements to add um, residents' health and wellbeing. Again, all homes will be managed by St Leisure Homes and allocated to those on the housing register using the choice-based lettings process in accordance with the local lettings policies. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd just like to add, um, so like I've sat down here three times now and I haven't seen anything, so I think it's probably probably time. Um, the, uh, the, sort of like the approach to the design on this particular one was sort of like we're asked to, sort of like to consider other sort of like successful schemes around the country where they're sort of like the more in an urban area. So the public open space is quite a departure from what we've ever done before in sort of like the council house build program. We've gone for sort of like a central urban park where it's like it's like the, all the residents that sort of like that back onto that, their their back boundaries will sort of like be a lot more open and sort of like an accessible to the sort of like to the area that's sort of like that's common to them all, so that there's like a, a general ownership and sort of like an, an use of that space visually, but also sort of like so that it doesn't become like a dumping ground, but it also sort of like it's, it becomes an amenity space where kids can play out there and sort of like enjoy it. So like the, the sort of like the scheme that we were asked to select like to consider was Marmalade Lane, which is sort of like um, won quite a lot of awards, um, where they have far more reduced back gardens, but sort of like but they 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 sort of like a, a, a achieve a similar principle of sort of like of having the open space at the end of the gardens in a more urban environment. Obviously on Marmalade Lane, they sort of like they mix the car parking with it, which we were asked to avoid because of sort of, like, of sort of like confusion where sort of like where cars can go and where people can go. So we have segregated the parking court away from the sort of like the public open space, but we think that it's something that's sort of like, it's a bit of a, a, a change and a departure from what we've done in the past, and we, we, we really hope it works. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions to the applicant? Councillor Cox. Thank you. It's just, it's just your open space bit there that you said has never been done before. I think if you go into Exthorpe, you can see areas that is very similar to that. And to be quite frank with you, it's a bit of a mess because it's not maintained. Um, there, are, uh, there are areas similar to that within the Council Six estate <coughs> where it's not maintained. So what kind of maintenance schedule are you going to have for this? And I'm, I am really lost with it's never been done before <coughs> because it has and it's not worked. 
Um, yeah, I, c I can address that. Um, so obviously I'm saying it hasn't been done before in the, in the respect of um, we've never done it before in the Council House Build Programme in the current sort of like range of sort of like of dis site designs that we've done. And I accept the fact that like that sort of like maintenance becomes an issue. We've got we've got a minimum of five year maintenance landscape schemes on all of these um, on all of these schemes where we have to select maintain them for five years, and they main they sort of they retained in the select in the south um, and the um, St Ledger Homes um, ownership. So so they they maintain them for for sort of like for perpetuity. Um, so from that perspective, the sort of like um, we we hope that the sort of like our approach to the sort of to the rear boundaries, which is the direction that our the urban design officer wanted us to go down, where they are more open at the rears, and sort of like you create a little bit of a, less of a barrier to sort of like to the to the open space, would mean that it's more legible and sort of like more accessible by the people that would use it. What I mean, it's more open at back. Is that a, a wooden fence or a? a brick wall that's at the back boundary of this open space sorry uh, so our latter proposals were to sort to have a low brick wall that would sort of like be around about sort of like 900 high and then sort of like have trellis or something that, that you could sort of like visually see through it into the into the open space above that thank you would you, would the residents have rear access to that yeah Yes, they would. Yeah, yeah. They've all got rear gates, which are again sort of like visual, so that so you can see through the gates. Do we have any other questions? No. Okay. This is the time where we're going to go into debate. Do you have any questions that you'd like to put to the officer? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, as you mentioned in your report, this doesn't meet some contributions that we would normally expect. I just want to make sure we're treating this as rigorously as we do, would if it was an application from outside of the council. So uh, what was the process for assessing that viability? Is it the same process as when it's a private developer that there's an independent viability appraisal done and then that's confirmed by our people? Or does that work differently because it's a public scheme? Can you speak to that? The applicant did provide um, a viability statement. Um, it wasn't forwarded on to our usual consultant. It's quite clear this is a council scheme. There's no profit making as part of a council scheme. It's purely to provide social housing clearly needed in this area. So um, it wasn't considered necessary to send it for formal viability testing. Um, officers took on board um, the need, the justification for the need, um, evidenced in the um, housing needs survey as well for this area. So it, it was slightly different in the sense that it wasn't sent to the affordable housing consultant. But that's because there isn't a profit element to assess in terms of... But that's because there wasn't a profit element to assess in terms of resale value and profit margins. Thanks. I'm going to go to Councillor Dixon and then Councillor Carr. Just a really quick one. Can I just clarify that the open space in the middle, so only residents can access that, or is it open to anybody? Because if it is, I mean, surely that's an antisocial behaviour concern. I believe these are locked gates to gain access. Is that correct? The architect will be able to confirm. Am I allowed to talk? Yep. Um, there are there are gates. Yeah, I'm up. afraid you're not. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Sorry. So that information we can't actually uh, quantify because it is believed, but I can't say for definite if it is for sure. Sorry about that. Councillor Cox. Thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Cox. Thank you. And you've said, obviously, it's, can, it's council housing, social housing that isn't supposed to be the net profit, 
but it's supposed to wipe its own face. Now, bearing in mind that there's only five years maintenance on this, and the we've seen we've seen developments similar to this in other parts of Doncaster that don't wipe their own face and have, have just look terrible. Now, how how can it continue? Because if it's not for profit, well, obviously it's not, but. I can't see there's any maintenance within it after five years. So is it just going to be left to rack and ruin after five years, like many other developments in Doncaster? I think he actually said, and he'll be able to clarify, that it's taken over by St Ledger Home for the ongoing maintenance in perpetuity. If you beat me to it, Chair. The, the, the landscaping scheme, which was referred to by Matthew, is the one that's secured for the five years, So, which is a standard, because anything that dies or is diseased or, or fades during that period is then replaced, uh, and that's to make sure that it establishes and, and grows away as it should do. In terms of transferring this once it's built to St Ledger Homes, they're then uh, required to maintain that in perpetuity, so that's th through the lifetime of the development. Um, just in terms of your question about um, profitability, the grant funding that's secured as part of this development and all of the sites moving forward uh, is ring fenced for the development, uh, the building out of it in effect. Um, so we've investigated whether it could be used for other aspects of the development, so things like BNG, uh, open space, those kind of things, and it can't be, which is what's impacted on viability. So if, if, if the grant funding was available for those aspects, then obviously that would be an ask that we would be asking for as part of the development. but. The design of the scheme has, has eked out every last element of what could possibly be achieved on this site in terms of maintaining the right quantum of development and trying to get the right level of development. And you've seen that through the previous schemes of trying to retain trees where possible, designing the schemes in a particular way that, that enhances the site features that you've got on there. Thanks, Gary. That's great. Um, but it, it just really concerns me when, when we look at... Uh, I'm sure we all see it within all our wards that, that we see the maintenance of open space when it becomes hard not being maintained properly. So would it not be better having a softer, maybe just a, a, a green open space within there instead of something something that, that would take less maintenance, being easier to maintain and not have something that is going to need to be looked after? I, t I take your point. I think you could make the argument that it, it's easier to maintain the way it's proposed because it's predominantly hard landscaping. So there's there's less that needs to be done in terms of cutting grass, for example. Um, th there are shrubs, obviously, and some trees there that will need maintenance of some description, pruning, etc. But in terms of um, actual going out and mowing on a regular basis, that obviously that element of it has been taken out. So in terms of overall maintenance, I would probably suggest there's less involved, so it should be easier to, to maintain. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a quick one. Um, just trying to work out where the waste bins would be sited, whether it's on actually on King Edward Road, Florence Avenue, Victoria Road, or it's going to be within that internal area and if it is if we're looking i can't really see it there there's a block of three houses there how how would they get their bin if it's asked to go onto king edward road there's bin stores provided within each property so it would be a case of the householder bringing the bins forward onto the next to the driveway or onto the driveway on bin collection days. So, so the bin storage is just on the front of the properties? No, it's, 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 within, it's within the, the rear of properties. Exactly. So my point is, house number, th the middle of those three, how does he get his, or he or she get their bin onto the main road without having to drag it all the way around there and come down the access? Because if that's somebody that's elderly or disabled, that ain't going to happen. So how do they get their bins empty? There's, there's communal alleyways, and there's the access into the back and down the alleyways for some of the properties. So they would still be able to do this. We're the best people in the world. Where? If you're, that, the house I'm really concentrating on here that, that seems to be an issue for this is that that block of three on King Edward Road, the one in the middle, 
the, the, where, if, if the bins have to go onto King Edward Road, how do they get their bin if it's in the rear? Well, not just one bin, but potentially two. How do they get them onto King Edward Road? Because I can't see where there's an alleyway. Yeah, that's exactly my point. They've got to walk all the way to the bottom of the garden, all the way down that thing, and then come back down on themselves. So if that's an elderly resident or a disabled resident, that ain't going to happen, is it? That's a design flaw that needs to be addressed, really. Um, and that's always the problem when you start putting three together. There's always going to be somebody loses out. Um, you know, the bin stores at the back of their property, they're going to have to drag it all the way out. And I, I do understand, obviously, if they're disabled, they may have a pull-out service. But that means the bin men are going to have to go in, and they're not going to do that either. They're going to say it's too much for them to do that. So I have a bit of concern about that, that middle property, really, on, on how they get their bin emptied. I, I appreciate, po appreciate your point. I, I do get where you're coming from on that. It's not dissimilar to what you'll have on private drives, though, where obviously the, the bin service will go to a certain point, and then they won't go onto the private drive. So there's an expectation that members of the public will take their bin out of the rear of their property down the street. I mean, I do it. Uh, probably 50 yards to the end of the street and leave it there. So it's, it's not an uncommon uh, scenario is what I would say. I, I appreciate what you're saying though. It, it's not one of those that um, I, I think you would prefer to have, but it, it's not an uncommon scenario to, to occur on certainly on modern housing estates, particularly where there are things like private drives. Do we have any other questions? Thank you. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to conditions? Can we have someone move that, please? It's been moved. I'll second that. Uh, all those in favour, show your hands, please. Thank you. Those against and those abstaining. Councillor Stapleton, did, I, I'm not sure I saw your hand there, so was it uh, for, against or abstention, please? Chair, if my hand moved, you'd know. I didn't abstain. You didn't abstain. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Therefore, this proposal is granted. Yep. Okay. I'm going to hand the next item over to the Vice Chair, to Councillor Duncan Anderson, because I now have to leave the meeting. Thank you. Right, before we move on with the schedule of applications, we're coming up on the three hour mark. Can we suspend the relevant standing order? Yeah, all agreed. Thank you. So we are on application number five, 22 slash 01962 slash three full erection of three two bedroom 100% affordable council houses on vacant land. The application is for houses, roads, and an associated infrastructure to serve them at garage site, Springfield Avenue, Hatfield, Doncaster, DN76RF. Mary Fleet will be taking us through this. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the last of the council housing applications being presented to members today. Um, just wanted to mention in respect of pre-committee amendments, as noted, um, with previous cases, Adam Goldsmith and Matthew Clarkson are to speak in support of the application. Um, and just a further note to make about an additional representation made following the second round of publicity, um, which raised concerns in respect of the maintenance of council trees in terms of the overshadowing caused by said trees. And a note was made in terms of um, potential um, concerns about antisocial behaviour in relation to the proposal as well. Um, just uh, wanted to note that the scheme was re-advertised to publicise the widening of the access which was required to meet highway standards. So this is an aerial view of the site. Um, it's allocated um, for, for residential development and the land is also um, in flood zone one and therefore to low risk of flooding. The proposal is for three 100% affordable two bedroom dwellings on the former garage site at Springfield Avenue. These are a couple of, of photographs I've taken when I've, I've visited the site, um, showing that the site currently contains a number of garages. Um, it's not widely used um, at the moment par uh, for parking, I think partly because of the, the condition of the site. Um, but the proposal is to improve this parking area as well as to erect the, the new dwellings. Um, in respect of the scheme, we've received three objections. Um, I've noted the latest comments um, 
made uh, just now, um, the other issues raised related to private rights of access, which isn't a material planning consideration, but it has been addressed, um, as well as um, a comment that's been made in respect of the construction process and what impact that will have on, on parking. So this is the, the pro proposed site plan, noting the location of the three dwellings to the east of the site with the parking located um, across, uh, with the parking located to the front um, with the parking, the additional parking for existing residents in the landscaped area to the west of the site. The proposed dwellings are a similar size to those that surround the application site and are considered to be in keeping and complementary to the character of the area. This slide shows the proposed plans for this type of, of house that's uh, being put forward here. The scheme meets the required separation distances between the dwellings and those existing. Equally, the garden sizes are in accordance with good practice guidance and highway development control have approved the parking provision and also the layout. The proposal meets national space standard and will provide a good standard of accommodation for those occupying the units. The design of the houses is modern. Arguably, these dwellings will raise the standard locally. They also meet the requirements of um, of approved document for in terms of being accessible and adaptable dwellings. We've been provided with these visuals which show, um, give an idea of the appearance of, of the dwellings from the parking area and you know it's, it's clear that the development will be an attractive addition to the area. These photos show the, the existing access. Um, it's, it's currently quite rough, quite puddly. Um, the site is in a sustainable location um, with, uh, within walking distance of the amenities in Hatfield as well as being close to the bus route to Doncaster and also to Thorn. Highways have originally objected to the application given the width of the access and the lack of a bin collection point within five metres of the road. However, these details have been rectified by the acquisition of a small area of the garden at number seven Springfield Avenue and highways have been able to remove their objection on this basis. To minimise any disruption to residents during the construction period, a construction method statement is to be agreed beforehand, which amongst other things will look, um, will look at the vehicle movements and how they can be best um, organised in terms of um, during the construction period. In terms of ecology, there's no objections to the demolition of the existing garages and it's been confirmed following a site visit that there's no requirement for a biodiversity net gain assessment. It's been confirmed also that the site has no bearing on ecology beyond the site and that ecological enhancement can be effectively conditioned. Though the trees are of a low quality here, uh, they do make some contribution to visual amenity and this application seeks to retain them and supplement them with additional planting of trees and hedges. The details of this are to be agreed by condition, but 50% of the planting will be required to be native species. In conclusion, the principle of the development is, is considered to be acceptable. The scheme will make a contribution towards the council's requirement to provide affordable housing the scheme meets policy requirements in terms of character and amenity and technical matters have been dealt with or can be reasonably dealt with by condition. The officer recommendation is that members look to approve the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Once again, we have Matthew and Adam. I'm sure you're familiar with the rules by now. Big red button, five minutes. Thank you, Chair. So the application before committee today as discussed is for the approval to deliver three new two bedroomed houses on um, a cleared garage site to meet the local identified housing needs. Again, cabinet approval was um, sought and received for this scheme on the 22nd of June 2022 um, and forms the six out of seven um, of the sites that we're bringing forward as part of the phase two um, council house build programme. The funding will be sourced through the approved housing revenue account um, and again supported by a grant from the 
South Yorkshire Merrill Combined Authority Housing Brownfield Fund um, and we'll be in discussion with um, Homes England to support the financial viability. Um, again, enhanced specification for the properties um, going beyond the building regulations and working towards the future home standard. Again, the properties will be built um, off gas, um, utilising the air source heat pumps, working um, and designed with sorry, high energy efficiency, um, the space standards, etc. Um, and trying to support the biodiversity um, as far as possible um, under the viability constraints of the affordable housing model. Um, as with the previous schemes, um, there's included photovoltaic um, solar panels. We've got the larger cavities to maximise insulation. Again, um, with a nod towards the issues around damp, mould and condensation, it'll have moisture resistant plasterboard in the kitchens and bathrooms. Again, what we're wanting to try and do is ensure that energy costs are minimised for residents um, and again support the council's ambition to address fuel poverty um, and support improvements to residents' health and wellbeing. Once again, all the homes on the site will be managed by St Ledger Homes and allocated to those on the housing register using a choice-based lettings process and in accordance with the local lettings policy. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Steve. Thank you. Um, regarding car parking spaces to, to the car parking area, are they for the existing residents or for the new development? Um, they're for the existing residents around the sort of like around the scheme. So the ones that sort of like potentially would have used the sort of like the garage court beforehand, our original proposals sort of like had more houses on that, but through sort of like objection, sort of like when we went out to public consultation, the uh, the consideration was that sort of like the loss of that parking was was detrimental to this to the area around it would have exacerbated parking on along Springfield Avenue. So we revised our proposals and sort of like and and, and, and built the, the car parking space into there. Thank Gary. you. Gary. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a quick one, and it, it's, re, it's surrounding the, uh, the issue here about the access being widened. Um, and it says the tenant number seven has been consulted by housing college agreed to this change. Now I'm going to assume that the tenant of number seven is, is a council tenant. Yeah. And um, what, I've got a slight concern here, and it is only slight, that if we go policy 44 of the local plan makes it quite clear that we must protect existing amenities, and that includes private gardens. Um, so whilst I understand that the, the tenant there has agreed to this what assurance can you give that he's had an informed choice as such that he doesn't feel that he's been pushed into making this decision does, does that, do you see where I'm coming from on that yeah thank you as part of the consultation process and certainly when we realized that there was an issue regarding the carriage width and um, the carriageway width um, it was actually the consultation was undertaken by our team that the resident actually um, isn't a king gardener and welcomed um, the strip of land being taken from them um, as having less garden to maintain so it certainly wasn't um, we provided a couple of different options in terms of what the opening towards the highway could look like um, they were certainly supportive of that and they'll be given a, a sort of like a boundary fence um, to, to reinstate what's taken away yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, additional representation that's in our uh, pre committee amendments regarding the concern about trees overgrowing, becoming invasive and overshadowing. Can you just uh, speak to the maintenance schedule and how that's going to work? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, as, as has been indicated before, they'll be on an, an initial five-year maintenance programme as part of the contract build. Um, they'll be subsequently moving across to St Ledger Homes after that to be managed and maintained. Um, the houses, the, the um, trees are on, housing revenue account land, so will form part of that. I think it's a, it's a point well made that historically, perhaps some of the trees haven't been looked after as well as, as, as they could have been and potential have potentially could have caused sort of nuisance or issues. I think as, as um, well sort of local and national policy swings round towards um, enhancing the environment and creating more opportunities for 
either retaining existing trees or, or planting new. Um, I think we need to be much more careful and considered um, as to how they're sort of maintained moving forward. But I accept the point on a historic sort of basis. Thanks for that. Any further questions from the committee? Okay, and we'll move into debate and questions to the officer. Gary. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick one, really. Um, Leyland Avenue to the right, um, and, and sort of going all the way further north there, I can't remember, can't remember the name of the street there. Um, Westfield Road. Westfield Road, that's it, yeah. I believe everything on that right-hand side is a conservation area. Um, can I just clarify that, that, that this Springfield Avenue development is not within the conservation area? I mean, as Ward Councillor, that's my understanding, but if we've got an officer here who has more expertise than me, they might be able to answer that. It's, it's not within the, the conservation area, no. Thank you very much. Thank that. you, Chair. Any other questions or comments? Just before we move to the vote, I'd like to say I know previous iterations of this project met with substantial public opposition. I just want to compliment the design team on the fact that they've managed to get to a point where only three people are objecting. It is a not inconsiderable act, uh, act of diplomacy to have got to this stage. So, moving on, uh, can I have someone to move the motion? Sue's moving, Gary is seconding, all in favour? All right, that is unanimous. Takes us on to application number six, planning application. 22 slash 2770 slash 3 full. Erection of a youth services module building with roof mounted photovoltaics and low carbon components with a new landscape surrounding land at Parkway South, Weekly Doncaster. DN 24JS. Jessica Hill will, when she's uh, set up, be taking us through this one. to go. Chair, can I just ask a, a, a very brief question, just something that occurred to me here. Go ahead. Um, with an application, bear in mind that the, we are planning committees on the, the understanding that we've all read our papers. Is it allowable for, under a, a legal thing that we don't have to go through the entire process and could just say, right, motion to pass? Or do we have to go through debate and everything else? I suppose the conformity of you not asking any questions would inform that the, you, you were all happy with the fact that the application has presented and the recommendation. So we, we have to go through the process of giving you the opportunity to have any questions or have that debate. Uh, right, but crack on not, then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quiet. I'll try and be quick. <laughs> Good afternoon, councillors. Um, so the site uh, for this application is located on land at Parkway South in Wheatley. Um, it's surrounded by a mostly residential area, um, Park Primary Schools to the south. Um, there's some, a multi-use games area to the east of the site and some commercial properties to the west. Uh, uh, so the application seeks full planning permission to erect a youth hub modular building. Uh, the site currently comprises an area of grass and there are some mature trees near to where the proposed building is located. Uh, no trees are proposed to be removed uh, to facilitate the building though. So the site is designated as protected open space uh, as identified by policy 27 of, within the local plan. The site's not um, subject to any other particular constraints or designations though, so it's not in a conservation area near listed buildings or in a flood zone. Uh, the proposed building is around 210 square metres, so it's relatively small, but it will take up some land within the existing open space area. Um, 
as it's next to the games area, it's sort of the intention is for it to complement that and the games area will be upgraded in future. And that's the intention anyway. Uh, here's just an aerial photo of the site. Sorry, I couldn't get a better one. Uh, here's some views from Parkway South, which is south of the site. Um, as you can see, there's some mature trees around the site, but not actually where the building is. Uh, here are the four floor plans and elevations. So the, the building measures 25 metres in length, 8.2 metres in width. Uh, it ranges in height from 5.5 metres down to 3.8, so it sort of dips in the middle to help screen the solar panels which are on the roof. Uh, landscaping is proposed to soften the development and help it blend in. Um, a new pathway is, is to be installed as well from Parkway South. So as mentioned previously, the site is designated as protected open space. Generally, development is not permitted within these areas unless specific criteria are met. Uh, it, it, the proposals have been assessed against policy 27 in this case, and it is considered that it meets parts A and D. Um, so there, there will be some loss of open space. Um, however, the, you know the modular building is uh, intended to serve as a youth hub, so it's gonna become a community facility. Um, the purpose of the building is to provide space for local children, um, and this is considered appropriate in this case. Uh, it's also considered that the development accords with Part D of Policy 27 um, as the proposal for alternative recreational provision clearly outweighs the loss of the current use of the land, um, and there is considered to be public support for the proposals in this case. Um, most of the responses to the pre-application seem to have set out support for the proposals as well, and I've only had one objection from members of the public. Uh, therefore, the principal development is considered to be acceptable. Uh, here's just an impression of what the youth hub is intended to look like. Um, the idea of the hub is for to serve sort of eight to 15 year olds, and they will likely be walking or cycling to the hub. Um, most most of the intended users are supposed to be from the, the surrounding area. Uh, typically, the hub will be open from sort of 4 to 8 p.m. Um, and 8.30 p.m. in the summer months. And the council will have staff on site to ensure that the space is maintained and cleaned. And sustainability measures. So the, the building has been designed to be energy efficient and uh, as low in carbon as possible. Um, various sustainability measures are included. So you've got solar panels, an air source heat pump. Um, this is considered to be in line with the council's aspirations for achieving schemes which are designed to reduce their environmental impact. Oh, that's my bad, sorry. <laughs> so overall, the building is considered to be an appropriate development in this case, um, as it will provide a valuable community asset. Um, and even though the, the site is designated as protected open space, the use of the building for the local community is seen to outweigh this this part of the um, loss of the open space. Um, the building will not actually prevent people from using the land, but is intended to encourage more people, particularly young people, to use the site. Uh, what happened? Oh, the recommendation is um, for approval with conditions. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jess. We have speaking in support, uh, Mr. Fraser Morrison, the architect, I believe. If you'd like to come down to the front. You'll have five minutes to address the committee. Press the big red button to start speaking. I'll warn you when you have one minute remaining. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think Jess has covered a lot of it, but part of the, the project basically sits around is one of four pilot projects that um, the Department for um, Culture, Media, Sport is looking to basically fund. Um, it, this is part of the youth investment fund and so the idea is to provide youth facilities um, across England for a variety of different people in the location where these youth are, are needing the space. Um, generally there has only been one objection um, from the community and Jess has kind of again kind of covered a lot of that. Um, loss of trees, we are not removing any trees. Um, there's also um, again the issues with uh, taking up the actual green space. Again, just looking at that and the way that we're looking to deal with that, giving that um, need to the, the youth, that's that's covered in that sense. Um, and then moving from there, 
again, the idea is to basically by attaching this to the existing MUGA and kind of add that additional investment, it will allow that space to come back into use and also providing more specific facilities that add to that and create a safe enclosure for youth of the area to use it kind of throughout the day and the summer months is kind of key um, to the proposal as well. And in terms of sustainability, again, just going over those points, um, the idea is that it will be prefabricated and built off site. So lessening the amount of disturbance of the neighbors when it's built um, and brought to site, it will be brought in kind of six sections. Um, and from there, it will be clad as well. So again, it's lessening the impact on the neighborhood while it's being constructed. And it's also lowering by as much as possible the amount of carbon kind of used in producing it. But other than that, I think everyone's a long day. Um, that's from me. Thank you very much. Do members of the committee have any questions, Mr. Morrison? Steve, go ahead. Thank you. Yep, looks great. I'd just like to know um, how this site was chosen. Um, so this site was chosen um, basically through a series of open calls to uh, councils across England. And councils that were then allowed to um, apply. Um, and in, un, in order to do that, they had to basically own a site um, that they thought they could develop. Through that, they then did a series of consultations to understand the need in the area. And so the idea is that this will be one um, in a long line of uh, youth centers. So instead of having one central hub that serves larger areas, we're looking to ideally, after this one, do a couple more that are spread and distributed across Doncaster, providing that facility and that kind of uh, accommodation across the, the area. Okay. Oh, sorry, Steve has a follow-up. Um, I, I meant regarding who were consulted within the area of, of this being there because I'm sorry I live in that area but the next to it there's a community building um, that has a it, I believe the ward members are trying to put a library together um, we have a facility within a, a, a park that's been given over to a community group uh, the, there are some community buildings I'm just, I'm just wondering where because and I don't know anything about it. Do you know anything about it, Sue? So, consultation? Yeah, well, you do? Yeah. No, we didn't, we didn't know. I don't know if I'm allowed to speak, am I? Not at, the... uh, not at this stage. Once we get to questions for officers, I think we might be able to squeeze you in. Are you a council officer? Sorry, I don't. I am, yes. Yes, I thought so. It's just I'm leading on this project and I'm. The architect may not know some of the background. That was yeah. Awful. Once we get to questions for officers, I will okay, allow questions you. to you at that stage. Just got to follow the procedure for this. Uh, I've got Bob wanted. Hi. Um, I believe the site should be used between four and eight. Yeah. So it's just a bit of an observation. So that takes away the traffic concerns of the objection with it being near the school, doesn't it? Because obviously it'll be after school time. Yeah. And to kind of add to that as well, because it's for local youth, um, I, I don't think any any 15 year olds hopefully will be driving there. Um, and so hopefully generally everyone will be walking. And then the occasional um, kind of instance that people will be driving, um, there's a lot of on-site parking anyway. Um, and hopefully because it's kind of outside of normal school hours that, that we're hoping that's, that's enough. Okay, Gary. Yeah, I was hoping we'd get through this really quickly, but as soon as Councillor Cox decided I thought I'll stick my oar in as well. Um, just a, just a, I suppose a quick question, and depending on what you say, but, but not a statement as such, but just an observation. Um, you mentioned there's only been one objection. And I was going to ask the officer this, but as he brought it up as part of his presentation, do you, do you know the nature of that objection? Um, so it was listed out uh, as a series of concerns. Um, so it was concerning the, the loss of trees, the use of the parkland, the um, basically the um yeah there's also the the extra traffic concerns and that was the the general points okay my observation is that i think it's really sad in doncaster we have people that keep objecting to youth services children's services being put in place and i'm sorry but i think a youth club anywhere in doncaster is a damn sight better than somewhere you can take your dog that, that can poo so, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather be you club than dog toilet. Thank you, Gary. I've got Iris with a question. Uh, yes, um, I couldn't find any mention of it. Um, have you thought about putting cycle racks there? Because um, 
young people of that age are quite likely to cycle, so better than throwing them on the floor. <laughs> So we provided um, five rack spaces outside of the front entrance, and the way that we've designed it is that the main kind of office where there'll be potential kind of on-site management, they'll be able to see out directly onto those, so kind of dealing with any uh, issues around that. Any further questions for Mr. Morrison? Okay, thank you very much. We now move on to debate and questions for the officers. Do I have questions? Steve, go ahead. Can I ask Lee Goals to say what Lee Goals wanted to say? <laughs> Go ahead, Lee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just picking up Steve's point, Councillor Cox's point, sorry, around consultation. We did quite a lot, uh, if I'm honest, including two in-person dropping consultations for people to attend. Numbers were low. We did online surveys. Uh, we did regular consultations with children and young people, regular consultation with ward members. And we've tried to create a number of forums where people can either, they are... They can do it online, they can do it in person. We've also engaged regularly with uh, Councillor Emma um, William Rawlins around the library. One of the reasons for choosing this site, two or three things really. One is le uh, linked to antisocial, levels of antisocial behaviour. Two is the lack of a current youth provision in the area. And the third one is about re-energising the area and connecting the new youth hub with the library, with the mugger, that can try and bring people back into that and create what we kind of look in a bit of a, a children and community zone. Thank you, Lee. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but we're part of, of Friends of Grove Gardens. As Friends of Grove Gardens, we've had, I'm not aware that there's been any consultation with Friends of Grove Gardens. Um, I think you're aware that a, a community building has been gifted, if you like, to a community group. I'm not against this, by the way. Don't, yeah. don't panic. I just want to know where the consultation finished because we obviously, Sue is aware of it, and we're not, even though we tried to look after a, gr a green space, yeah. which I find extremely strange. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on these, but I believe that we consulted in the legal range of uh, the radius that you have to do within the, the actual site of the location. There's a certain distance you have to consult within and we, we complied with that. I don't know where where the Grove Park is compared to where this will be, whether it was in that or not. My assumption is that it isn't. No further I'm questions from you, Steve? Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, in that case, I will... The uh, Recommendation is to grant planning permission. Do we have someone moving that? Gary's moving it. Bob is seconding it. All in favour? That is unanimous. Motion passes. That takes us on to appeal decisions, item six. Reports for information only. I believe we won them all and none of them were uh, committee decisions anyway. So anyone with comment on those? In that case, I believe that's the last thing. Yep, meeting closed. Thank you very much, everybody.